So Dr. Tamsin Furtado is uh, presenting her talk, Helping the Leopard Change Its Spots, How We Can Use Behavioural Change Science in the World of Zoo Animal Nutrition. Tamsin is a social scientist with a background in global, in global health and has a specific interest in the interconnections between human and animal health and well-being. She has completed a PhD at the University of Liverpool, particularly, uh, sorry, studying how we can improve management in obes of obesity and equids. And she particularly focuses on horse-human relationships and human behaviour change around this. She now works on projects covering a wide range of aspects of understanding human behaviour in order to improve animal welfare and companion animal welfare. And in, in using social sciences, uh, she is finding out more about how we can help people to change to benefit animals. Although Tamsin is a self-confessed horse nut, she hopes to work with animals across the board in future. Um, and I think that her presentation today will be an example of how this could very much come about. Um, she has previously been involved with charities ranging from Southeast Asian wildlife to British domestic pets, and particularly loves goats, because who doesn't love goats? Okay, so I will stop sharing my screen and thank you all for listening to me go on and on. I will let Tamsin share hers. Thank you. Hi everyone, good morning and good afternoon. I can see we've got a really international audience, so good afternoon, good evening, good night. Um, okay, so uh, I'm just going to share screen, share sound. Hopefully this will work, oops. Okay, um, okay. can you see my presentation now? All good. Okay, brilliant. Thank you so much for having me. I'd like to say a big thank you to the organising committee. It's absolutely fantastic to be here. I'm a bit gutted, as I'm sure you all are, that um, we can't meet in person because I would have absolutely loved to chat to you all over lunch and coffee and so on. But um, feel free to drop me an email um, or a line if you want to talk about any of the things in this presentation or just generally um, you know, about animal welfare, animal nutrition. Love to hear from you. So. Um, I don't normally start by doing this, but I always think in these Zoom presentations, it's a bit weird because uh, you don't really get a feel for who the person that's presenting is. So this is me meeting a lovely playful owl. Um, I am, as Lauren said, I've been um, uh, working at, for the University of uh, Liverpool. I also work with a, a group called HBCA, Human Behaviour Change for Animals. Um, and in both jobs, uh, what we really focus on is um, is looking at the human side of the animal welfare problems um, and how we can use social sciences, uh, psychology and so on in order to, um, in order to help people to change. Um, so that's me, I currently live in Wales and just because I feel like you don't know people properly unless they've told you about their pets, I have a lovely cat called Tink who's very noisy, a lovely dog called Sophie who loves to run and a very opinionated lovely horse called Merlot. <laughs> so that is me. So why do we need to understand um, human behavior for animal welfare. Well, I always think the best way to think about this is to think about how there are very, oh, sorry, uh, there are very few welfare issues with animals where you can change things for the animal and improve things for them without first having to change human behavior. If you can think of any examples, I would love to hear from them, but um, it's usually quite hard to, to think of any because even if um, the person you have to change is yourself, <laughs> usually there is a person who's in charge of our domestic animal behavior and even wild animals um, to some extent um, when we need to when we need to step in and, and make changes, there are usually people, different stakeholders involved there. And yet, whether you're a nutritionist or a behaviorist or a vet or a keeper, whatever your role is, it's pretty unlikely that you will have had specific training in how people think and how people behave. And, you know, possibly some courses have, you know, like a day on communication skills, which is brilliant and really important. But that's just one small part of human behavior. And yet human behavior change is the root, sorry, human behavior is the root cause of, of many of the animal issues that we see around us. So a better understanding of human behavior change can help us to increase compliance when we need people to behave in certain ways. It can help us drive action and change uh, different practices, and it can help us as well understand people better. So um, as animal uh, people working in animal welfare here, you'll be probably very familiar with the idea of for animals that we change things in very small steps and in a very um, careful and empowering way where we, um, you know, we encourage those kind of small, uh, easy habits to change and make it very rewarding to do the changed behavior. But we don't usually think about humans with such a compassionate approach. Um, and yet, you know, we are animals too. That's also how we work. 
So I'd just like to start us off thinking about this by sharing um, a video that really summarizes to me um, how we can uh, how we can feel about change and as as this video is playing just think about um times when you have felt like either the woman in the video or times when you felt like the man in the video maybe scribble them down um and i'd love you to share them okay so i think um i, I love that video because to me that summarizes how we often think about change you know often when we want to approach one of these issues sorry i'm just getting the presentation back when we want to approach an animal welfare issue um or many issues in our life actually this um applies just as well to um you know trying to change our partners children colleagues <laughs> in whatever ways we often feel like the thing that we want them to do is really obvious and um because we have a better better knowledge as we see it that we can tell them what to do and that they should be able to do it and we feel a bit like the guy did in that video like come on it's so obvious there's a nail sticking out of your head if you just change that your life will be so much easier but actually, we also all know, and um, we probably all have experience of how it feels to be on the receiving end of um, someone who's trying to make you change. So often people feel like they don't actually have um, any knowledge about human behaviour change. But um, in fact, we've all been doing this our entire lives. We do have a lot of knowledge on it. We just don't always reflect in the ways that we might. So just have a think. Um, I'm going to tell you a story about my own uh, change. Um, and uh, just have a think about times um, at work or in your personal lives um, when you have tried to make someone else change and was successful and if so why do you think it was and if not why not um, and also how you felt times when people might have tried to make you change so um, the story that I thought I would share um, it doesn't show me in the best light so bear with me um, but um, I think it is uh, really kind of shows um, how the way that we treat people um, impact how we how, how they feel about change so um a few years ago now i for various long-winded reasons got involved with a small independent animal sanctuary quite near me um, and they had predominantly horses but also rabbits goats um a couple of sheep and chickens ducks and so on um, so quite small and run by a lady who had um Give the, who, who dedicated her life to um, to working with these animals and running this sanctuary, but um, all uh, entirely funded by public donations and so on. Um, so quite small scale um, in terms of funding, though not in terms of number of animals. When I started um, getting involved with them, they just moved to a new premises. So um, they had, uh, they just moved on to this new place and they had a little bit more space and they were quite excited about that. And um, at first I was really impressed with the work I was seeing there. So um, when it started, so I was someone who was very interested in animal welfare, had, you know, obviously done lots of various courses, workshops and so on, and kind of live and breathe like welfare standards and so on. And uh, the lady who was running it um, didn't come from that sort of background, but had obviously been running a sanctuary for a long time. So although I could immediately see that there were some uh, less than ideal um, welfare settings, the um, ethos that I started with was being really um, impressed by the work they were doing and so for quite a while it worked really well because um, we kind of worked as a team so this lady was the expert in how to run a sanctuary and um, I was I, wouldn't, I hesitate to say expert but I was um, you know could come from a slightly different field and we could chat about things like maybe we could um, for example offer more enrichment or change the way um, that you know um, some of the animals would spend a lot of time indoors um, in pens so we could offer them more turnout and so on um, and for a while that worked uh, really well and I think the reasons it worked well are that um, I came from this idea of like of really respecting the work that this woman was doing and treating her like an equal expert um, but just with a different set of skills so I could I would suggest things and then we would talk about things and we would talk about how it worked and then we would compromise. Now um, I'm going to guess that some of you have probably had similar experiences and, and might guess where this story is going. After a little while, um, the new space that the sanctuary had began to fill up as more and more cases came in and um, the I began to feel like things maybe weren't um, working as well as they might for the animals. I'm not here criticize, to criticise this woman at all, I'm, I'm criticising myself here. So rather than treating this lady like an expert anymore, I began to feel like a little bit more like the man in the video. I began to feel like, for goodness sake, we've clearly got too many animals. Uh, you know, clearly we need to rehome more, clearly we need to do this or that or whatever. 
and um and so my attitude towards her changed and obviously <laughs> unsurprisingly what then happened um is that our relationship began to deteriorate and so i would um i would make suggestions based on what i felt was my my better knowledge and my frustration with the things that i was seeing around me because i found it you know and you will all have been here absolutely when you see animals treated um in a way that you don't agree with it's incredibly frustrating and it's incredibly hard to put your feelings aside and i wasn't very good at doing that and as a result, our relationship gradually deteriorated until it came to a head over one particular case of a horse who, um, who was in a lot of chronic pain um, and a difference of opinion about what the future of that horse should be. Um, now I'm happy to say that um, years down the line, she and I are good friends again, um, and I'm uh, lightly involved with the work they do. But what was really important for me about learning about that experience was that I don't think she changed through that process. The only reason that it stopped working and I stopped being able to influence her was the way that I was treating her. And we saw in that the video about the nail, I mean, obviously that's like a joke video, but it, sum, it really sums up the way that we feel. So we, if, you, if you think you can see something really obvious uh, that needs changing, it's almost impossible to put aside your frustration and say, come on, just make that change. But actually that, um, is, is almost the worst thing you can do because it puts people on a back foot. And if you've been in the situation where someone has tried to make you change, so I can tell you this with uh, <laughs> my partner's endless attempts to stop me being so messy, um, it's actually, it's very frustrating. <laughs> and you feel like, oh, come on. Uh, but I'm, you, you, you know, we all have good reasons for doing the things that we're doing. So the thing about behaviour change science is that it helps us to reflect on our own experiences and, you know, we'll all have plenty of experiences of being on both sides of those changes. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on, I'll just move that top bar, I'm not sure if you can see it, but um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on um, what changes you see as necessary for the captive animals in your care, particularly around nutrition what human behavior changes are necessary and whose actual behavior do you need to change? So um, I'd love to talk about this in the, um, in the Q and A session later, but do put any ideas in the chat as well and I'll try and catch up with them. Um, so whose behavior is it? Are we talking about the behavior of the public? Are we talking about the behavior of um, the keepers at the zoos? Is it other nutritionists? Is it your boss? And when we think about changing other people, we often neglect the idea that we need to change ourselves. So the story I just told you, the most important person, um, the, the, the change that inhibited anything improving those animals' welfare came from me. So um, if I had been able to maintain, you know, the better, um, you know, respectful way of treating that lady, then I would have been able to help her. So are there times when your behaviour would actually have been better to have been changed? Oops, sorry, slides, there we go. So I come from the field of human behavior change, as you know, and um, this isn't really, uh, it's not one science. So um, what we do is to bring together insights from lots of different areas. So social science, behavioral economics, counseling, um, anthropology, psychology, education, communication, social marketing, and so on. Um, and bring together all of the lessons that we can learn from these different fields. Unfortunately, there have been lots of lessons in human health and human nutrition um, and how to change people that we can um, apply um, without too much trouble to the world of animal welfare and animal nutrition. So today in this presentation, I'm going to be talking about the four key principles of human behaviour change as we see them. Firstly, that change is a process. Secondly, that understanding psychology is key in driving change. Thirdly, that the environment influences our change much more than we usually give it credit for, and we can use that to our advantage. I'm getting ahead of myself. And fourthly, that change must be owned. So I'll talk about those each in turn, um, and then um, we'll talk a bit about, um, about projects and monitoring and so on, and then um, allow some time for questions. So the first part, change is a process. Now, when we want someone to change, so I come from the field of, um, uh, well, my PhD was in equine obesity, which is a massive, one of our biggest welfare problems in the UK. Um, and um, often in this field, vets are asked, particularly vets are usually the ones tasked with, with solving this problem. Um, and usually it's seen as a case that the vets should be able to tell 
the owners that the horse is overweight and the owner should therefore the next day put in to place some um you know some changes to the horse's welfare which will make it lose weight easy right um but actually change doesn't always work like that because if you think a bit more about our human uh, um about our behavior um and and how it works and think about the way you behave interestingly knowing something doesn't always mean you'll do it so we don't actually always act in a logical way if we all acted in a way that we knew was the most sensible then none of us would drink none of us would smoke we'd all eat a very healthy diet and we'd run every day maybe and um, we'd have a healthy work-life balance and we'd be good at prioritizing and we'd never binge on netflix and all those things that um you know we that that are probably not things that we would want to you know maybe would choose for someone else but are things that we enjoy on some level so awareness of something doesn't always result in behavior change we can see that with um if you um you know everybody who smokes knows that it's not good for your health to smoke and most people think oh, i should give up at some point in the future but whether or not you do it is nothing to do with how aware you are of the fact that smoking is bad secondly a change in attitude doesn't always mean behavior change um a good example is of this is um many of my colleagues are vegan and i'm vegetarian and i would quite like to be vegan because I think it's better for the environment and animal welfare but I'm not uh, although I, I dabble in veganism um, I, I have the attitude that veganism is, is probably better for the environment and um, animal welfare but um, actually taking that step is nothing to do with my attitude <laughs> um, it's actually much harder to make those changes in real life and probably the thing that will make the changes is if I you know get my bum in gear and, <laughs> and you know plan meals better and those sorts of things so it's nothing to do necessarily with um, attitude or, or knowing something is bad and thirdly even our intentions and our planned behavior don't actually always lead to behavior change now it being January um, this is no surprise to you all how many people here had uh, a new year's resolution um, perhaps to well, not go to the gym this year obviously but um you know perhaps to exercise every day or whatever and um and you know it's the end of january a lot of new year's resolutions maybe won't have happened already dry january is a good example as well um so we a lot of the time we can even intend to do something we've all been there and then actually in reality um it doesn't happen so a better understanding of why things do or don't actually convert into behavior um, can, uh, can help us to understand people better. And when that, those changes involve animal welfare, then we can, um, we can better help our animals as well. A really nice way of thinking about this process of change is this model that's called the stages of change model. It always gets called, it, sorry, it also gets called the trans theoretical model of change. And what this suggests is that um, change isn't just like the vet says the horse is fat and you change. Um, in fact, it happens in stages. So the first stage is pre-contemplation, and that's when you don't um, you don't really know about the change. You don't know that it's something that you should um, you should do or could do, or that it's even a thing. So um, an example from the world of obesity. Let's go with dog obesity for now. A pre-contemplative um, con contemplative. I can't say that word very well. Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, a client would be one who comes into the surgery with a really overweight dog and doesn't know that it's overweight. They don't. They don't even know they have a problem. Contemplation is the stage where you are aware of the issue and you think that maybe it might be an idea to make a change, but you haven't yet got to the stage of actually thinking about making the change. So um, we were talking about um, smokers. That's the stage where you're thinking, oh, I probably should give up. Should I read that quick book or should I join Stoptober or, or I'm not really sure. Um, so that's the client thinking, oh, my dog is a bit overweight, but um, oh, I don't really know what to do about it you know, maybe looking for advice and so on. The next stage is preparation. So in this stage, you are thinking, right, okay, I, could, I should make a change. This is me, um, veganism, I, I should make a change. So actually I'm gonna buy more uh, vegan products and research the, um, you know, recipes that I'll be using, for example, and plan my meals better. This is the client saying, right, okay, I'm gonna, um, yeah, I've accepted the dog's fat and I'm going to, um, I'm going to work out what I'm going to feed instead and work out how I'm going to change. 
Then the fourth stage is action. Um, well, unsurprisingly, that's where you begin to take an action. And then, um, and then ideally, you learn to maintain that action. Uh, maintenance is something that's um, often completely forgotten in, um, in when we do campaigns and things around animal health, um, but is actually just as important as the other stages because as we all know, <laughs> you know, all the diets we go on, all the tri changes, I'm going to be healthy this year and so on. Uh, we can get to the point of there being action, but we often don't follow those through. And um, with dog, um, dog obesity, there's a really good um, example because uh, I think it's something like 60% of dogs uh, return to the previous overweight status after they have successfully dieted, which is a real issue, at least in the UK. Now, the important thing about this model as well um, is that you can see in the middle, um, we have, it says learning from relapse. So you can have a relapse at any one of these st stages where something goes wrong and you fall off the model of um, the stages of change. Um, but you can also come back on at any stage. And this model is really important because um, it the, the, the part about relapse is really important because it basically says that um, th that's a normal stage of change and we should welcome it but we should also say so what are you going to learn from every part of the relapse so if um, I don't know um, let's say the change that you're trying to make is to go to the gym more often um, and on one of your planned days you don't go to the gym that's fine um, and it doesn't mean you fail it doesn't mean you know that classic diet thing of our I had cake so now I'm off the diet whatever um, but actually um, we can say okay that's fine you didn't go to the gym or you ate the cake what uh, you know what were the circumstances that meant that you couldn't fulfill the change on that day and how can we alter those for the future so that's a really helpful way of thinking about stages of change. So just as a little example, with um, from the world of obesity, um, we usually say that if you're initiating a conversation with a client about an overweight pet, a really great way to start is by saying, what do you think of the dog's weight or cat or whatever? Um, because that immediately tells you what stage of change they are. So if they're like, oh, I think he's fine, you know they're in pre-contemplation and your energy is best spent in um, helping them to see that the animal is overweight. But if they're saying, oh my God, I've been trying everything to get this dog to lose weight, but he keeps, I don't know, going next door and then they feed him, then you know that they're in the preparation and action stages and your energy is best spent on helping them to successfully diet that dog or cow or horse or whatever. Um, I really like this model as well. I'll just kind of briefly mention this. So um, th this is a model that go, like, th thinks about the emotions that we face when we're told about a change that we might have to make. Um, so we start off, um, we often start off, if we're, if we're shocked into a change, we often start off by feeling almost kind of denial and frustration. And it's a bit like stages of grief um, before going into a stage of kind of maybe, um, before we accept a change. Um, I've got a small example of this. It sounds like such a small thing in hindsight, but if you're a behavior change person, you um, you end up really over analyzing your own reactions and going, oh, that was very interesting. And um, so a small example, um, I showed you uh, my dog, um, Sophie, who's a Frenchie. So she's an accidental COVID dog that we've ended up with um, from a family member who couldn't look after her. And um, she wasn't walked before we had her, um, but um, she absolutely, because she's never done it before, she absolutely loves going out walking and running now. And I love to run. So um, I was running with, with Sophie and um, she's super fit now after, after months of this, she looks absolutely fantastic. She doesn't have too many like boas symptoms or whatever. And, um, I put a post on a, a, a there was a, um, a Facebook group that I'm on where they were talking about um, running with dogs and I said something about running with Sophie and a behaviorist said to me in a very kind way but she said um, you know you really shouldn't Frenchies should never be, run more than two or three kilometers because their hearts are working harder than a normal dog and also they could be prone to um, you know arthritis in the long term and so on and you're probably really damaging her health and um, it was really interesting because the stages that I see in the, the, the red half of this screen are definitely my initial reactions were this kind of this kind of feeling of, oh, my God, I, I'm a responsible person. We've changed this dog's life for the better. She loves going out and running now. Of course, I'm doing the right thing and I'm being a good owner here. So I definitely felt shock and denial. And then and I felt that kind of, you know, that weird feeling when you know you've like done something wrong. And I was like, I don't I, obviously I don't you know, I want the best for the dog. Like what if I'm actually hurting her health? It's such a small thing, but it's it, you know, it's important to reflect on these things. Um, I'm happy to say I didn't go into depression over it, but um, but the next stage was skepticism. So I was like, no, nah, that can't be true. 
Hello. Of course, she loves to run. That's silly. Um, and a bit of confusion. Then, I mean, and it literally is just literally like the, the chain of emotions is like literally described on here. Then I was like, OK, fair enough. She actually has a really good point. Um, I would like to know more because obviously I want the best thing for the dog. So ex exploration. So um, the exploration step. I'm, I'm friends with a lot of vets, um, small animal vets, and uh, some of whom are also runners who had accompanied me and Sophie on runs and so on. So uh, exploring the idea with them, um, you know, did they really think it was OK and so on? Um, before we came to a decision, which was a compromise, basically, we won't do the longer uh, longer runs and days in the hills with Sophie but we will um, carry on running because she enjoys it so much and it's um, she's pretty she's a healthy dog who's well checked over so that's such a small example but I think it's so important if you think about the changes that you might need to to, um, to encourage people to make in your day-to-day -day life so um, another example here in the UK is we, we have a really bad prevalence at the moment of people feeding um, livestock, particularly horses, in fields. Um, not the, the animals aren't anything to do with them, but because more people are walking around due to the coronavirus, um, they're going in fields and, um, you know, feeding. Like there's been an example of a sheep who um, died because someone fed it a satsuma and it suffocated um, a horse that very recently died because someone was feeding it potatoes um, and so on. But those changes where you, you kind of shock people, um, the initial stages that they go through, you shock them and say, that's really bad, that animal could die from that, or whatever. The initial stages that people go through are those kind of shock, denial, frustration, depression um, stages. And it's very hard for them to listen um, at that point. So we have to encourage people and encourage them to get to those, those green stages, exploration, acceptance, and so on, um, before they're going to learn. And in that instance, with feeding animals um, inappropriately, which I'm sure you must come a lot across a lot in zoos, um, it's getting to that point of, okay, well, how can I interact with the animal in a different way that's more responsible and better suited to the animal's actual needs? So principle two, psychology is the key to driving change. Well, there are lots of um, factors that we have to consider in relation to psychology. And of course, each of these is a, you know, a huge uh, field of exploration in itself. Um, but we've got, um, of course, we all have our individual attitudes, beliefs, values and cultures. We've got our past experiences and our memories that affect us. We'll all have different ways of expressing our emotions. Of course, we have different um, language um, arising from our culture and our family. Um, we'll have different motivations and so on. And all of these things are driving us to behave in different ways. And so a bit like what I was saying to start with, um, when, because we're driven by all these things, we don't necessarily make our decisions and our actions because of you know a logical or rational reason so sometimes people describe it as you know in um star trek i always get confused between star wars and star trek hope i haven't offended anyone there in star trek <laughs> spock um is an example of someone who makes very logical rational decisions and he says he hates he's not hates he he dislikes working with humans because um they're very irrational and emotional and he's like what well, can't you just make all your decisions based on logic um and captain kirk who works with him who is a human and is very emotional and impulsive and driven by you know wanting to change things for good and so on um they have a you know a real interplay and that's a bit like what happens in our heads so there are probably logical things that we all know we should be doing but actually all the factors that i listed on the previous page our cultures our emotions our habits and so on are driving us to behave um in slightly different ways which don't always match with our logic so to work on that some of the things that um, particularly make a um, make a difference. So one really interesting thing, you can see this play out on social media all the time. If you become a geek like me about behavior change, just have a little look next time you see someone arguing about um, the coronavirus, the way, I don't know whether it's a conspiracy or not, or whether the government's right or um, Brexit, if you're in the UK or whatever. Now, um, and look at the language people use and the way others respond to them. Confrontation is the biggest predictor of failure to change that we know of. How interesting is that? So if, um, and that's a bit like the nail video. So if someone is doing something and you confront them about it and say that's wrong, that is the biggest driver of likelihood that they won't actually make that change. How weird is that? When we think about making someone change, we often think about telling them straight and, um, you know, 
like it's a bit hard I always find this hard because it feels like um you know you want to be able to just be straight with people and just tell them come on this is what we should do um but actually that doesn't help people change so um because all that happens is that if you confront people um if you think of going back to that you know the the um the kind of traffic light diagram i showed when you confront people you leave them stuck in those stages of like denial and frustration and so on and they're like well you know whatever i don't believe you um and actually i don't really like your attitude so i'm just going to ignore you so confrontation um doesn't help people change even though it's often the first thing that we think we should go to um, instead, what does people help people change is if you show empathy to them. And this is the biggest predictor of success for change shown across, five, like, I think it's over 500 trials. Um, so in this instance, so if, if we, I don't know, we, let's take the government response to coronavirus, well, conspiracy theories around coronavirus um, as an example. When you see people arguing on social media, which is a great platform for observing how behavior change happens, when you see people arguing, if people go in and go, <laughs> you need to educate yourself, that's one of my favorite comments that they make, you need to educate yourself, you don't understand, um, you just don't know, you're clearly stupid and all those things. Um, people, um, you know, obviously that descends incredibly quickly into an argument. Whereas empathy, you know, I can, I, mean, I hear that you're really, upset about that and I totally understand your concerns um helps to get people on the same level and this is a bit like the story that I told about the lady the sanctuary earlier on in the presentation when I was um showing empathy and understanding her position and so on we were able to have an actual coherent conversation about change where we both felt like we got something out of the conversation and we also have to be aware of our cognitive biases so we all have different biases which make us also behave in different ways we all want to believe we're right that's um that's a really interesting bias so the reason one of the reasons confrontation is doesn't doesn't make us change is because um we all that there's no one who wants well there are some people the vast majority of people don't want to um hurt our animals or feed them inappropriately or make their dog really fat or whatever it might be most people think that they're doing the thing they're doing because they think it's the best thing or the most responsible way of keeping their pet or whatever um so if you um confront people all that happens is that they kind of practice the reasons for why they're doing what they're doing um and they <clears throat> and they, they kind of go over and over them in their head and we have a thing called the writing reflex where we um we kind of practice and we want to be right so it's it's the reason that you know if you have an argument with someone afterwards you might find yourself going over and over in your head but this and I, obviously i'm right and you know you need to sometimes share it with a partner or a friend to express that like to, to share oh my god i can't believe how you know that they said that or whatever that's because we have this writing reflex where we have an in integral need to be right so that's one of our many <laughs> the many types of biases that we hold that we have to account for when we're helping people change. Also, much of our behavior is habitual. Um, habits are a huge field of study and they're really interesting and so overlooked in terms of human behavior change. I think particularly around feeding behaviors. So um, we think about 45% of our daily behaviors are actually um, habits that we do. So they're driven by little cues. So like, I don't know, I guess out of bed, the cat's right there. So the first thing I always do is to feed the cat. <laughs> Very different from my boyfriend he waits for her to stop meowing um, the, the, um and then uh you know and then i'll probably go to the loo or whatever then i'll go downstairs and make the tea you know actually although we don't think about it each of these little things is driven by different cues um who knows what would happen if the cat wasn't there when i got out of bed <laughs> my cue to feed the cat wouldn't happen that you know will um we this happens like all throughout our lives and throughout our day you know there'll be different things that you always do at certain times of the day when you make it um, when you make your dinner what time of day you exercise um and when you're helping people to change um hooking things onto a habit is um is really important so um that's the reason that changing to vaping is um has been a good way of stopping people smoking because you haven't had to replace the habits you've just exchanged it for something else um so um, we, ha we, ha we work like this. It's an energy saving mechanism for our brain um, to just kind of go through the motions as it were without really thinking. Um, habits, interestingly, are stronger than our intentions. So, um, I mean, we all know that um, 
through our practical examples in our lives, but we often don't think about it. So, you know, you can intend to do so, I don't know, intend to, um, let's say, feed the dog less, but actually it's your habit to pull out an entire cup of food or whatever, or, um, you know, for the dog to be eating for that amount of time, whatever it might be. So because routine and repetition are so important in our animal behavior, um, we, we often don't think enough about the way that habits actually shape what we do, particularly around feeding. So um, I think a nice example is like if someone told me that we would have to reduce Sophie's, um, Sophie's dinner, you know, if I think about the habits, that, that's fine. That sounds like a really tiny change. If they said, right, OK, you've got to reduce her feed now. But actually, if you think about all of the things that happen with making Sophie's dinner, there's a lot of like habits that go in there that have to be changed. So what is the cue that tells us that it's Sophie's dinner time? Well, um, you know, it's she's, she's very good at not reminding us. So generally it's like 7, 7.30, so it's time-based. Then um, she'll go and sit in a certain place. Then we'll open a certain cupboard. We'll pull out a certain cup. There's a lot of different things there. And if you wanted to change what went on, you would have to account for those things. But we can actually use habits because animals build repetition so quickly. We can also use habits to help people change. So in the um, instance of dog obesity, it doesn't take very long for a dog to learn that at seven o'clock it's going to go for a walk and get excited. And before long, it's pretty hard not to take your dog for a walk at 7.30 or seven o'clock, whatever it might be, um, because they're reminding you. So actually, habits are really important and um, yeah, and, and very overlooked. Um, yeah, and I'd be interested to explore that more with you in the, um, in the chat later, if you think there's some scope there. So self-efficacy theory is another part of psychology that basically says that we like to do things that we're good at and, um, and that we kind of believe in. So um, we're more likely to repeat different actions if we've done them well, exactly like animals. We want to be rewarded. We want to feel good. And, um, and you know, we don't want to endlessly be doing things that are kind of too difficult for us or that, that make us feel bad. Um, so often when we think about change we expect to be able to as I was saying before kind of just tell people to change and expect that they'll, they'll kind of just make those changes and so on but actually um, a better way of um, thinking about change can be to sometimes break those changes down just exactly the same as we would for an animal if we were trying to help them to do a new behavior um, and make small changes that make people feel good um, a lovely example of this in the UK, um, I hope that there are some cross-cultural um, examples of a similar thing, is um, Couch to 5K, which is um, a free programme which helps people to learn to be a runner. And it's called Couch, as in like a sofa. Like you go from being someone who sits on the sofa to someone who runs 5 kilometers and um it's a really it's been so successful so basically you download podcasts and it takes you through these really tiny steps so the first i think the first week you are literally walking for 15 minutes or something like that and it very very gradually builds up um i know loads of people who have never thought they would run five kilometers but because it builds up so gradually it has celebrities who can do the talking to you with the podcasts and the music and you know tiny steps it helps people to build up really slowly before they know it they've achieved their task but not just achieved the task at the end they've achieved on every single run because every single run has not been too difficult for them <coughs> excuse me so i'd love us if you know if you have one takeaway from this talk <laughs> to think about how when we uh, when we think about making changes for animals then we think about breaking those tasks down into small changes um, and making them rewarding not just that but we also think about what's going on for the animal to start with you know we never start training without making sure that the animal isn't stressed um to start with is it in an environment where actually it can engage brain and and learn so it's the same um it's really the same process with behavior change with people we want people to feel good we don't want to have that kind of confrontation um that i was talking about that just makes us feel bad and makes us rehearse the reasons we were doing the thing in the first place <clears throat> so principle three, the environment influences change. Now, this is another area that's often completely overlooked. Um, the examples here um, on the bottom right there, you might recognize this is one of the shoots from Temple Grandin um, in the States. Her um, 
changes that she made to slaughterhouses. Um, the reason being that slaughterhouses, um, often the environment was actually inhibiting, it was increasing the animal's stress levels and also making it harder to move them through the processing units, which was taking time and stressing out the, um, uh, the people who were working in the abattoirs. So um, just by changing the environment, um, for, by having, for example, um, shoots where you couldn't see through the side, made it a lot easier for the, a lot less stressful for the animals, which made it easier to work with them and so on. So that's a really great example of change with animals, um, which has impact both on the animals and on the people. But also there are lots of examples of, of our human, um, our human environment and how we influence our own change. So if you want to recycle, how does it feel to be, to have four different bins and you work out which bin to put it in, um, put to put your, the waste in, uh, whereas if you want to recycle and there is only one bin that rubbish goes in, a really tiny example, but if there is only one bin <laughs> that you can put rubbish in, as um, Lauren Samet knows, <laughs> I'm a bit of a, um, a, a kitchen warrior at the workplace with the bins and the recycling. <laughs> um, if there's only one bin to put your stuff in, then you can't recycle. So these tiny changes, which seem really obvious, but actually if we look at what's around us and how that's working and how it's affecting us, then we can think of ways that we can change um, our environments when we want to change um, for animal welfare. The top right example is a lovely, a great one. Um, this was very well uh, reported. So um, in, in uh, men's urinals, they wanted to find a way of encouraging things to be less messy, shall we say. And um, the best way, uh, rather than saying, you know, be careful where you aim, the best way um, of encouraging men to be less messy in, uh, when using urinals was to put a little fly <laughs> at the point where they could uh, aim. And uh, a really tiny example of behavior change, but a very famous one um, that, um, that really influenced behavior, even without any instructions or anything. So I wanted to talk about um, the environment a bit because <clears throat> people have often heard of, when people think of behaviour change, they often think of the word nudge as a result of this book, uh, which I absolutely thoroughly recommend, um, really interesting, which talks about the different small ways that our environment can be influenced in order to make us behave in certain ways. Um, now, people often confuse behaviour change generally with nudges. Um, and they're not the same thing. So nudges are one type of the wider field of behavior change. But um, nudges usually refer to the sort of small changes to our physical environment that make us behave in certain ways. Um, a really lovely example of a nudge is that um, here in the UK, um, there was uh, a bit of an issue with getting um, organ donations. So most people had the attitude that they wanted to donate their organs. Um, and that was shown in study after study. Most people had the attitude, but they just wouldn't take the behavior of signing up to organ donation um, databases and so on. So there was a real issue because of a shortage of organs for people who needed them. So a tiny nudge that was made was that when you sign up for your driving license. Um, you're automatically opted in to have your organs donated unless you opt out. It's very easy to opt out. Um, you just have to tick a different box or whatever. But um, just by changing that tiny thing and making it automatic that you behave in the way that is congruent with your attitudes, it has um, dramatically increased the number of organ donations that we have in this country. So a tiny, tiny change to our environment which has changed our behavior. Now when we think about our environment we often think about you know the physical world around us and those are the examples I've shown so far but we also have to think about our social worlds because our division our decisions and our behaviors are heavily influenced by the people around us um, we all want to fit in and, and be liked. And there have been lots of studies that have shown that um, we'll, we'll do bizarre things like saying things that we know are completely wrong, um, just, just to fit in with the people around us. Um, and we all think, oh, I wouldn't do that. But uh, plenty of studies have shown <laughs> that actually that's, that's not the case. We all do behave in um, you know, ways that we think are socially acceptable and um, ways that we think will make people like us. Now, interestingly, with behavior change, that work that can work really well. So if you want to change something in your life and you get friends who do the thing that you want to do, 
um, then that's a really successful way of changing. So that's why they say running is contagious. So if you want to, um, you want to become a runner, make friends with lots of runners. If you want to, um, a, a nice example from the equestrian field in the UK is that um, there, there is still a lot of training that's very traditional and based on um, negative reinforcement and positive punishment. Um, and it's very hard for people to move away from that because that's what's happening and you're seen as quite weak if you don't um, you know, tell your horse who's boss and so on. Um, and one of the best ways of encouraging change with those things is to have people around who are understanding and who are also on the same journey or have been on the same journey before, unsurprisingly. So in terms of using this for animal welfare, um, again, this is really powerful because there have been lots of studies that show that telling people that something is a social norm is a really powerful way of helping them change. A, a classic example is, um, you know, when, do you remember, do you remember those days when we used to go to hotels, conferences and things? No more. But if you can cast your mind back to those dim and distant days, um, you'll remember that probably every single hotel room has a sign on it saying something about reusing your towels. And um, reusing towels is a really interesting one for um, behaviour change people, because behaviour change geeks, I would call them, <laughs> because um, you have... Um, you know, all all hotels obviously want to want you to reuse your towel um, at least sometimes because it's good for their uh, washing and their costs, but it's also good for the environment. So they all have different messages. Some of them say, um, some of them say, you know, it will be good for the environment. Some of them say, um, I don't know. Yeah, well, all sorts of things. You, you'll have seen them. You'll have seen lots of examples. Um, the more geeky you become, the more you'll take note of them. <laughs> I haven't been to a hotel for a while, so some of them elude me. Anyway, the most um, through lots of different field trials, it has been shown that the most successful way of getting people to reuse their towels is actually through saying 99% or whatever of people who stayed in this room reuse their towel uh, for you know several days in the duration of their stay. So aligning you with the other people who have something in common with you, they've previously stayed in the hotel, perhaps even stayed in the same room as you, and you hear that they are doing that behaviour and it makes you want to do the behaviour as well. So again, something that we can uh, take from and, and use in the field of animal welfare and animal nutrition. So, you know, 100% of our guests haven't fed, <laughs> haven't inappropriately fed our elephants this month or something, it could work pretty well. So um, in terms of a little bit more about uh, social theory, um, another a good example is when, when new changes come about, when we have something, a new idea, um, we have this way that it kind of diffuses across the population, uh, which is that you have a couple of people who will be your early adopters, early innovators, and they are the people who are like happy to, that they're they're probably confident in themselves and happy to make a change in that particular instance. So um, uh, I think I mean if you look at the raw feeding with dogs is a good example. So there will have been people who were innovators. Um, I'm I'm not remotely passing comments on the pros or cons of feeding dogs raw. By the way, I'm just saying this is a social change that we're currently seeing a lot of, certainly in the UK, presumably in other countries. Um, so there will have been people who were innovators who thought cool, that's a good idea, I'll do that. Um, and then gradually shared their knowledge with some early adopters who are happy, people who are happy to, um, to make those early changes. And then you gradually, what happens is that that gradually diffuses through, the, through a population um, if it's changed in the right way. So then you get an early majority. Um, and I think what's really interesting about this theory is that you'll always see some who are what we call laggards who won't make the change until later on. This model always th makes me think of my mum, <laughs> um, because back when I was growing up um, 30 years ago, um, she was an innovator, um, or maybe an early adopter, I don't know, in terms of plastic in supermarkets. And um, when we were in the supermarket at the checkout, so embarrassingly, she would take off all of the plastic on the packaging to make a point about the amount of unnecessary plastic packaging there was in supermarkets. And I remember it because it was really embarrassing. And I was like, what are you doing? That wasn't a thing that was done there. People didn't care about plastic, didn't think about it. She was an innovator, an early adopter. If you did that now, that would be quite cool. Um, and, you know, certainly I can imagine uh, lots of my millennial friends doing that kind of thing and everybody being like, yeah, well done. That's brilliant. So um, a nice example of um, 
uh, yeah, so, someone being an early innovator, it seems weird at the time when someone does that sort of thing, but like gradually it can diffuse across a population. And, you know, in line with that, I love this quote, um, which is really from a long time ago, but just shows how kind of how long these things take. All truth, pa all truth passes through three stages. First, ridiculed, second, violently opposed, and third, accepted as being self-evident. And we do also, of course, always have people who, um, who are those early innovators, who are happy to stick their neck out and, you know, do something unusual. Um, and there have been lots of studies that have worked on finding those people and then using them to help and to create change. So if you if you have a change that is a new um, a new idea or a new thing, then working with the people who are happy to be those kind of innovators and take a risk and, you know, be seen, ideally someone who um, has the respect of the community, be seen to be doing something different can be really powerful. So I think the message is that we need to be thinking in a kind of systems based way. So not just about people and telling them to change, but also thinking about the physical and social environments around us, just like we do when we want animals to change. The fourth principle is that change must be owned. And what this really means is that people um, particularly are willing to change if they've been a part of it. And I mean, it kind of goes along with that proverb, so tell me and I forget, show me and I remember, involve me and I truly understand. So when we think about teaching in classrooms nowadays, generally the activities are much more involving, there's a lot of questions, um, unfortunately that doesn't work so well with Zoom presentations, um, but we, um, the more you involve people in what they're learning, the better, which is why we're having workshops later. Um, so if just telling people and particularly I guess this applies to zoo visitors for example um those the types of activities that you have where people are involved in some way even if that's like literally having to you know flick through something or, or do a task to get some knowledge um when people are kind of involved or have to do tasks then they're much more engaged with the learning um but if you need to make changes on a, a deeper level then working with the community that you want to change to find out what's important to them and empower them and have them um, become a part of that change is what causes it to be lasting. And that's why so human behaviour change minded education, as we would call it, um, would always be very um, participatory and um, would work with people in that way to kind of help them to create changes that are meaningful to them in a way that is meaningful to them, because um, you know, often it reminds me of I used to work in global health um, and so we do a lot of work in Africa um, particularly and it was really interesting how many kind of very colonialist um, programs there were and it was you having to be very aware of the, the kind of legacy of that, that there was this uh, kind of very colonialist groups of ideas that where people come in and tell people what changes need to be made but actually those weren't always applicable in a you know African village or whatever so um, the changes that were going to be lasting were things that made sense and were useful um, and and kind of fitted in with the, the culture um, within the community that, that they were working with then. So good old Barack Obama and um, I think a nice quote to sum that up is I'm asking you to believe not in my ability to create change but in yours so moving away from this idea that we want to change other people but thinking instead about how we can encourage people to want to change themselves so just really briefly oh sorry moving this thing across the screen <clears throat> so when we think about the different options for intervention, so um, I'll just briefly talk about these. The, the, there are different thing, different ways that we can influence people. On a, I'm talking on a kind of community or population level here, rather than um, necessarily individually, although it can apply individually. These come from um, a book called, um, well, a, um, a system of change called the COMB or Behaviour Change Wheel by Susan Mickey from um, UCL in the UK, which I'm happy to share later if you're interested. So, of course, we can do education, and that's usually the thing people think of first, um, although there are limits to education, it should be one part of a bigger puzzle. There is the dog. Um, then um, we also have um, training. So the difference between training and education is that training usually is about building capacity and building skills, whereas education is usually about increasing knowledge. 
persuasion so we can use communications to make people feel like something is a good idea ideally um, you know ideally they tell you why it's a good idea rather than you telling them but we can also model um, the rights behavior so um, we see this um, a lot in um, animal obesity again so we often try and have people model you know um, I got my a better way of getting people to help that to get their horse to lose weight is not to tell them your horse needs to lose weight, but um, to have them work with someone whose horse has already lost weight and and uh, have them see what behaviours were needed in there and to um, aspire to and look up to that person and see actually that was you know um, that's that's a change I want to make. Incentivization, little used in animal welfare and has pros and cons, but um, you can have an incentive which obviously can be financial, but can also be something like um, uh, can also be something like um, a positive feeling, for example. Um, so what are the incentives? And we see this a lot. It's called gamification, you know, like um, again, back when we used to travel, TripAdvisor will, uh, if you leave reviews, will give you particular badges and so on. Um, so again, little used in our animal welfare world punishment um you know we'll find you if you feed the animals in the zoo <laughs> um what how does punishment relate to your field there are often um punishments they're not um always that i think that they're useful in some some settings although not all restrictions obviously we're all used to these with good old covid um having rules and regulations which sometimes um again useful in some situations and less so in others and environmental restructuring, which is what I was talking about before, about changing the physical um, or social environment to make change more likely. So these are some examples of the different types of ways that you can encourage change um, in, a, in a given situation. But the most important thing, if you're interested in creating a change, is to think that the, the problem that you're looking at, um, so let's say, um, uh, well, we'll go with dog obesity just because I've mentioned it a lot. So the dog obesity is the tip of the iceberg. What's actually going on there? Why is the dog fat? It's probably to do with the human dog relationship. It's probably to do with um, the kind of uh, culture of the household. Um, so like we have big treat. And I'm, I'm happy to say the dog's not fat at all and neither is the cat, but I'm a, I'm a feeder. I am um, <laughs> I love feeding animals. And um, so I would definitely have to rein that in um, if it was if I was giving too many treats, for example. So um, I have a, like a personal, my kind of culture, I guess, of the household is that the dog probably gets some of everything that we eat, like a little bit off the end. Um, so that's to do with my own uh, feelings about food and showing affection. Um, and whether that ends in a fat dog, you know, telling me to stop the dog being fat, I, I would have to change those emotions to do with me, my relationship with Sophie and so on. So uh, the dog being fat, is is a kind of tip of the iceberg problem with lots of other um, lots of other things beneath it. So we can't ever just expect people to change without first finding out what's actually going on for them and what's behind the problem in the first place. So we can do that through things like interviews, focus groups, participatory research, um, and so on. We have a few minutes left, Tam. Um... Oh, perfect. Okay, that's great because I have probably about three slides left. Um, <laughs> thank you. So. It's also really important to evaluate um, any project that you're doing. And this is often ignored, but it's so important because there have been lots of examples where behaviour change projects actually haven't worked in the way that people assumed that they would, maybe because the initial research didn't work too well. So it's important to know exactly what behaviour you're trying to change and what, um, what success would mean to you. A lovely example of this is a project back in the 90s. We had a big problem in the UK with teenage pregnancies. Um, and there was a behaviour change campaign which gave teenage girls and boys um, a, a baby doll to have for, and they had to have it for three days, I think. Um, and it was a very realistic doll which would cry and it would toilet and it would need burping and need lots of attention and so on. And the idea was that the researchers thought that if they, if the, the kids um, or young adults experienced what it was like to have a baby, they would be like, oh my God, I never want to do this. And they would be more careful um, about having unprotected sex. But unfortunately, fortunately, they monitored the pro project because the unfortunate um, outcome of that project is that if you give teenagers who are heavily driven by their hormones <laughs> um, <laughs> a baby doll to look after, in fact, it makes them more likely to um, become pregnant. Um, so 
it's really important because that doesn't seem like an intuitive um, response. You wouldn't expect that. But if they hadn't have monitored that project, then um, who knows where the UK would be today. Um, so, yeah, so you have to, to be able to monitor, you have to know the specific behaviour that you want to change and the outcomes that you want to be affected. So the take home messages are, are firstly, for any problem, you need to understand the problem before you try and change it. We can't make assumptions about why things are happening. Um, we have to understand. And people are so interesting. You know, everyone's interesting. People are surprising. We always make assumptions that, you know, they're, I don't know, feeding the animal because they're, I don't know, whatever we might think um, that they're, I don't know, they, they just want to interact with it in some way or whatever. But, you know, they have amazing stories for all the things they're doing. So working with them to find out what those are will not only kind of broaden your mind, um, but also uh, help you to create kind of meaningful changes. We can then have creative interventions. So people always say, oh, we need more education. But often the problem is quite different to education is good when there's a knowledge gap. But if it's not a knowledge gap problem, we can often um, change things through, for example, social um, changes or, or the physical environment. And through doing that, we can take a systems approach, which brings together people's behavior, their intentions, um, cultural beliefs, um, the society around us, the social and physical world and so on. Of course, we have to monitor and evaluate projects throughout. Sounds boring, but super important. Um, and we have to embrace um, the organisational and cultural approach. So often, um, I'm, I'm sort of laughing as I say that, because often one of the things that we find is that um, we, we work with a team um, at an organisation who are very keen to have um, to use behaviour change principles um, to with the project. But often it can be the management months i'm not criticizing any managers here but often you'll have like an organizational culture which doesn't make that change very easy which makes it then you know the impact on the animals several stages down so you do have to think about the organizational culture as well so thank you very much for listening i'm very excited to hear your questions and comments and things and um to chat to those of you later who are on the um on the workshop um, please do feel free to email me um and if and add me on twitter if you want as well um, so yeah, if you're interested in learning more about human behavior change, um, I recommend signing up to the HBC for Animals um, newsletter, which has lots of examples, um, e-learning courses and that sort of thing. Um, and, um, and, you know, training opportunities and just links with um, relevant papers and that kind of thing. But yeah, please do email me. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to hearing from you. So Brilliant. thank you very much. So next we have uh, Dr. Uh, Leonie Bayer, uh, who uh, is coming up next. She has worked with wild and captive bats of all different species in many different places. She really is a bat expert. Uh, her research interests revolve around the questions, how does the way bats perceive their environment influence their behavior? Um, and how did their behavior shape their perception? Or how does their behavior shape their perception? After working in a bat sensory ecology uh, lab at the Max Planck Institute of Ornithology, she obtained a PhD on bat echolocation from the uh, Ludwig Maximilians University of Munich and the International Max Planck Research for Organismal Biology. She has since continued her scientific work on bat sensing and behaviour at the Technical University of Munich and will soon set out to the Panam um, Panamanian jungle, that's a mouthful, where she will study multisensory perception in frog eating bats as a research fellow of the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation. Her expertise lie with bat behavior and bioacoustics, but she has over 15 years of experience with bat husbandry around the world, which has left its mark. Um, her favorite pastime, uh, very uh, usefully, is uh, watching bats feed. So she, we really are in good hands with her. So I'll hand it over to you, Leonie. Welcome along. Okay, <laughs> thank you for the nice introduction, Lauren. Like you said, I'm a behavioral uh, neurobiologist by trade. So I did a lot of reading for today and it was so interesting for me as well because I came across a lot of things that I hadn't known before. So thank you for inviting me here today. Um, during the time that I've worked with bats as a bat person, I have also uh, treated or like nursed some injured bats that have been brought to me. And with one of these bats, uh, it needed extensive flight training. So I took it to our local bat wizard in Munich. And she told me this story 
of how one day she got a phone call um, from a lady who said, yeah, uh, my son, he found a bat and uh, he's been taking care of it for a couple of days now, but um, I feel like now the time has come that a professional should take care of this. Okay, said the, the other bat lady and said, yeah, so is the bat all right? Uh, has it been eating? And the mother said, yeah, um, my son has been feeding it with banana. So this story is happening in Munich. So the bat lady thought, oh my God, I have to get there as soon as possible. So she went to this uh, people's house and they showed her the box with the bat inside. And it turns out that boy had found the only uh, bat that would eat bananas in all of Munich. It was an escaped Carolia from the local Hellerbrunn Zoo. So um, the title of my presentation is The Husbandry of Chiropterans because I want to uh, make it clear that bats are not just one type of animal, but are in fact a gigantic clade of different species, more than 1400 species in fact. Um, I'm sorry, it keeps kicking me out, here we go. Um, bats are an ancient group of taxons, about 65 million years old, and they have radiated into 1400 species. So when I looked up what kind of species are being kept in zoos around the world, but when I uh, found this list here, which lists only the European zoo species, I kind of stopped looking. Um, so we know many different bats all around the world, so let's have a look maybe at their family tree. Um, without going too much into detail, I hope you can all see my mouse here. We can see that bats, which is the order Chiroptera, they are not closely related to other small mammals like rodents or shrews, and they are also not closely related to primates, although primates and bats share some properties like uh, longevity, for example. No, instead, uh, bats are rather closely related to this group of animals that includes the carnivores, the ungulates, and the cetaceans. And then when we zoom in on the bats, and it just, here we go, then we zoom in on bats, um, we can divide them into these two suborders in green and in blue. And this is based on genetic analyses. Some of you might be familiar with the traditional division into the microbats and the megabats. And this was based on morphology or basically on the fact whether the bats could echolocate or not. But as it turns out now, um, the non-echolocating megabats are actually more closely related to some of the microbats than to others. And this means that the ability to echolocate has most likely evolved twice within the bats, or which is actually not so unlikely seeing how echolocation also involved in, uh, in whales convergently. Or the other opportunity uh, possibility would be that the megabats have lost the ability to echolocate a long time ago. And actually, there is one single species within the megabats uh, that can echolocate, but using a completely different mechanism. So either way, um, the concept of micro megabats is still very useful for describing certain subgroups of bats. Oh my god. As diverse as bats are, as diverse are their different feeding habits. So we have fruit eating bats, we have nectar feeding bats, and bats that eat other plants, plant parts. Um, we have the group that is called insectivorous bats, although that is not really accurate because these guys, they eat not just insects, but also other arthropods like spiders or centipedes. Um, so, but I guess arthropod of Boris would be a real mouthful, so people say insectivorous instead. Then we have carnivore bats. Um, they eat, yeah, for example, like this frog eating bat here, they eat frogs or um, lizards, other reptiles, other amphibians, um, small mammals, even other bats or birds. And then inside the, the meat eaters, we have also the fish eaters. So there's actually a lot of bats that eat fish. Most of them uh, hunt freshwater fish, but we also have two species that hunt uh, fish in the, uh, over the open ocean. And then of course we have the vampire bats. 
um, that feed exclusively on blood. And then we have the bats that just don't want to stick to a category and that we call omnivores. Um, and actually most of the bats do a mixture of diets as we will see later. If you want to, um, every time somebody enters the rooms, I <laughs> have trouble clicking. Okay. Um, if we want to assign the different feeding strategies to the different bat groups, that's actually not so easy, but maybe as a rule of thumb, we could say that the more or less pure insect eating bats are found within the group of Vespertilionid bats. These are the evening bats that, for example, we mostly have in Europe and in temperate uh, zones of America. So all European bats, for example, are strictly mm, insect arthropod eating bats. No, actually also not. We have one bat that eats birds. So never mind. Roughly insectivore bats uh, in Europe. And the only group that really is strictly vegetarian, these are the pteropodids or the flying foxes, uh, which is why they're also called fruit bats. But not all fruit eating bats are necessarily fruit bats. We also have fruit eating bats in the family of Philostomidae. And actually, this is a relationship that is. Uh, local, global, so the fruit bats, the pteropodids, they only exist in the old world, that is in Africa, in Asia and Australia. And there they have uh, filled this ecological niche of pollinating flowers and dispersing seeds. So they exist in the tropics and subtropics. And as they eat fruits and plant parts, they have a very important ecological role to play. And since these bats do not exist in the new world, in the tropics, we in, in the new tropics, we instead have the philostomid bats taking over that role. But it doesn't mean that all philostomid bats are fruit eaters. We also have, for example, uh, the frog eater over here, the trachops, that is a philostomid bat, and also all vampire bats belong to the philostomidae. So now we have an overview uh, about how diverse everything is, and I hope I haven't confused you too much. Um, what I want to say is I'm trying to give you an overview about the dietary demands of bats, um, but it's very hard to do this in 45 minutes. So I'm going to focus on the actual uh, dietary demands of everybody, basically. And then at the end of the talk, I maybe uh, have time. There may be time to go into the details of some groups. So um, approximately 50 nutrients have been identified as dietary essential for mammals. And as mammals, this would also apply for bats, we would say. Um, but the one nutrient that is usually not thought of is not even something to eat. It is water. So we'll quickly talk about that too. And then um, we will talk about energy demand because that's why we all eat. And then this energy demand can be uh, covered with the carbohydrates, obviously with proteins uh, and with fats. So we talk about essential fatty acids. And then I want to tell you the little that is known about vitamin and mineral uh, needs in bats. So let's start maybe with the water. So about drinking bats. Um, bats lose a lot of water when they fly because they're outstretched wings, as you can see in this picture, they make up up to 90% of their body surface and they are not covered in fur. And instead, um, they're covered with a dense net of capillaries. So there is big potential of water loss here. And in addition to that, of, of course, they lose a lot of water through breathing, especially when they fly, just like we do. Um, the need for water intake still depends on many different factors. So the more proximate fact, proximal factors like the current ambient air temperature or humidity, uh, the exposure to sunlight. And then also um, it depends on the metabolic rates and the food composition that these animals uh, use. But interestingly, the need for water intake can even differ a, uh, on a population level. So there was a study where they took bats of the same species, but from different populations all across America into captivity. So from Northern America, from more arid areas and from Southern America, where it was a 
from like more humid areas and then really from the tropical zone in Central America, the same bat species. And when they were in captivity, they had very different water needs because the bats had already adapted on a population level to their individual uh, habitat that their population grew, grew up in or evolved in. So when we have bats in captivity, here we go. Uh, do we have to offer them liquid water? I would say yes, in general, yes. Although in the wild, um, for example, fruit bats, they can survive on the water that they get with their diet, but we don't know what else they eat and what else they do so much. Um, and I'm gonna come back to the to waterhole visits a little later in the talk. Um, then we of, but technically they can cover their water balance with their food. Same goes for vampire bats. Their diet is literally liquid, so we would assume that they have enough water. Um, but the insectivore and carnivore species definitely need water. Um, do they all need fresh water? That's also a yes and no question, because some species are actually able to consume seawater and excrete all the salt and live off that. But that's also not entirely true because they don't live off the seawater as such. They mostly probably get their water with the food that they eat, the fish. So um, the natural drinking behavior of bats almost always occurs on the wing. That can be that they fly over a water surface and sip it up like a pelican style, uh, or they lick it up, or some other bats, they fly over and with their belly dipping into the water and then just soak the fur and later lick up that water from the fur. Um, here is, I hope you can all see it, a video from a Shriver's bat that is drinking from a water surface. This is in the lab, but this is also what it looks like in nature. And the interesting thing now is that you can fool these bats very easily by presenting them a surface that in echolocation looks like water, which would be any kind of smooth surface. So for example, sorry, this is again the water. So for example, this is a smooth metal plate. And you can trick the bat into drinking or trying to drink from this. And this is super hardwired. It works in newborn bats. As soon as they learn to fly, they have never seen a water surface before they do this. And the converse effect is that they do not recognize a water bowl when we place it in front of them. So they have to learn that this is the water source. So we have to take that into account when we have bats in captivity. And then also the matter of how we present that water bowl is important. We have to consider how well these animals can maneuver in flight and also when on the ground. So some bats have no problem crawling and running around on the, on the ground and they will take a water bowl even if it's like in the middle of the floor. But other bats, um, they don't like crawling on the, on the ground. So you have to place um, the water bowl right next to the wall so that they can crawl down and drink and then crawl back up. But other bats might just fly to the bowl so again, you have to take into account the, the exact species needs and how well they can fly and crawl around in captivity. Okay, so this was it about drinking. Now we come to the eating bat. Um, since bats are usually very small, they have a very unfavorable surface to size, body size ratio. And that means that they uh, lose a lot of energy by a heat. Um, in warm regions of the planet, that is not a problem. But uh, it and in, in temperate zones, bats have evolved the ability to go into torpor to save energy. But the problem is when they're active. So when they are hunting for food, they are flying. And that is basically the most costly locomotion mode there is. Um, so since bats are the only mammals that can actively fly and not just glide, um, it makes them basically very hungry. And the more scientific term for very hungry is that they have a high uh, metabolic rate. So when we look at the energy demands of bats, um, we measure the basal metabolic rate, that is how much energy they utilize per unit of time 
when the animal is resting and resting literally means not just sitting but also not digesting so fasting instead and um, also not producing body heat that means they have to be in their thermoneutral zone so when it's too hot they need to uh, to spend energy for cooling and when it's too cold they need to spend energy for heating obviously um, so, but this base meta metabolic rate is also different depending on species or on depending depending on the bat group, I would say. So, all the fruit eating bats they have what I would call a normal uh, baseline metabolic rate, and by normal I mean it's comparable to other mammals of that body size. But uh, in insect eating bats the baseline is lower and people suspect that this is because almost all insect eaters are uh, able to go into torpor to lower the body temperature and to actively lower the metabolic rate. So this also kind of has, has an influence on the baseline. And then on the other hand, the nectar feeding bats, they have a higher metabolic rate because they need to be um, able to, yeah, to spend vast amounts of energy for their hovering flights. So these nectar feeding bats, what they do, they do the same as hummingbirds. They hover in front with incredibly fast wing beats in front of these flowers that they feed off. So as you can see, the energy demands vary very strongly with the activity. And there have been a couple of studies that looked at heart rate in bats. And um, so I think the, oops, the record was a fruit eating bat that went up to over a thousand heartbeats per minute in flight. Um, this is not the record in the kingdom of animals. So the record I think is a hummingbird with 1500 uh, heartbeats per minute. But you have to take into account that this was a bat that weighs about 18 grams and it has a giant heart. So bats, all bats have giant hearts and lungs to power flight. And so with every heartbeat, it pumps a real big volume of blood. So 100 beats per minute is really, really high, considerable high. Um, the interesting thing is that these bats, when they rest, the heart rate goes down to 300 beats per minute. But the very surprising thing uh, that researchers found just two, three years ago was that in bouts of about five minutes, several times per hour, these bats even lower the heartbeat further. So the heart rate goes down to 200. Imagine this is an 18 gram bat, so that's very low. Um, and they do that several times per hour and that saves them up to 10% of energy over the course of a day. So very cool. And um, another example I have for you is then an insect eater that is even smaller, that's Molossus molossus. It weighs about 10 grams. And they have a heart, so again, a 10 gram bat, they have a resting heartbeat, heart rate of 130 beats per minute, which then can go up to, 100, uh, to 850 in flight. So I guess here you can see the wide, uh, wide range of heart rate, which also means a heart, uh, wide range of metabolic rates. And obviously it's hard to say what is the, the the average over a day and especially in captivity it's really hard to say how much the energy demands of, of a bat are because we don't know how active um, they are so they might still fly around but from what i know for example of of my bats that i work with in the lab they are um, philostomid omnivores they eat, they are fed mostly on fruit and they avoid flying if they can so they're very lazy um, and I say they really don't spend much energy on flying around, so they don't have to go. So in the wild, bats fly for kilometers per night, even sometimes even more like hundreds of kilometers per night to get to their food sources. So we have to take that into account every time uh, we want we look at our bats. How much are they actually moving, and what does that mean for the energy demands? The second thing obviously is that when female bats are pregnant or lactating, that that uh, rises the energy demands enormously too. So um, for example, an insectivorous bat that eats usually about a third of its own body weight in insects every night, 
that amount can go up to about 70% of its body weight when this bed is lactating. So they are eating for two, obviously, and that while bats already have to eat a lot in uh, comparison to their body weight, um, that goes up quite a bit. And then again, they have to fly around with that extra weight. Okay, so how do they feed all of these energy demands? Like any other animal, they consume carbs, proteins, and fat as the energy sources. So now we're going to have a look uh, into these groups more specifically. So bats that feed on carbs, these are mostly the nectar feeders. So what you see here in this video is a tube-lipped bat. That is a record holder in terms of longest tongue on earth, I think. Um, if this was a human, the tongue would be several meters long. So here the, the tongue is longer than the entire animal. Um, and they have these really cool uh, bristles basically on the tongue. So it soaks up a lot and then they, they lick it all up. There are other nectar bats that instead have little channels basically in their tongue and they, they don't put the tongue in and out of the flower, but instead they use it as kind of a straw to suck the nectar out. Okay, so carbs are uh, the source of energy obviously in fruit eating bats and nectar eating bats, but also in insect eating bats because chitin also contains a lot of carbohydrates. Um, what else is known about the, the how do they deal with all this sugar? So you might think that a bat that if it eats sugar its entire life might develop diabetes at some point. Um, that is not the case. So first of all, um, also, I guess, like humans, bats are able to directly metabolize the sugar that they ingest, so very quickly, and they can also, re they are very insulin sensitive, and they can very quickly clear the sugar from their bloods. Um, so frugivore bats are better at this than the insectivores, so they have a faster up uptake of sugar from the bloodstream into the tissue than the insectivores. And they also have a, a lower fasting blood glucose level. And this probably is what uh, protects them from developing uh, diab diabetes. Okay. Then when we look at protein, um, so there are some bats where we have no doubt that they consume enough protein. One of them uh, are the vampire bats, obviously. They consume high amounts with the, their blood diet. Also the, um, the meat eating bats, but uh, the fruit bats might have trouble. And it's been argued that both uh, groups, so the, the flying foxes and the philostomid fruit eating bats, they have to over ingest on energy in order to meet the protein requirements because uh, fruit are so low in protein. But that is actually not uh, the case for for all bat species, so it has been shown that some fruit eaters are fully capable of covering the entire protein demand just with fruit. And that is because they pick a big variety of fruits. We'll get to that later again. And, and for the nectar feeders, um, they accidentally or not accidentally feed on pollen a lot. Um, but still, some bats, they have to supplement uh, their fruit diet with other foods that are rich in nitrogen. And that's often at the end um, of the rainy season and the beginning of the dry season, when they start switching to more nitrogen rich foods, like for example, insects or also eating leaves. Sorry, okay. Yeah, like I said, pollen and insects. Now, when we look at fats, so we all know that fat is the best source of dietary energy. And in fact, you can also really make uh, bats obese if you feed them a lot of it. Um, but it also is important for the absorption of certain vitamins. So, um, and also it's a source of the essential fatty acids, omega-3 and 6. So although there's not much known in bats, um, it's just recommended that we supplement them just like for other mammals that you include the essential fatty uh, acids in their diet 
at a certain percentage, mostly the uh, linoleic acid. Um, I know from, again, from, from the bats that I've worked with, that they all really like fat and oil. <laughs> um, and the, when you think about mealworms, they have a high fat content, but they also have a high protein content. So it's not clear why the bats love mealworms so much, but all of them do as far as I know. Okay, so now I want to talk about the vitamins coming from the essential fatty acids. Um, this here is a juvenile fruit, Jamaican fruit bat that is happily chomping on some oranges because like almost all, uh, because almost all species of bats cannot synthesize vitamin C, they have to eat it. There is some small evidence that some bats of the, of the, uh, some insectivore bats actually, of the, the yin top, heroptu, oh yeah, yin, tero, heroptu, <laughs> so that blue group, that they can somehow synthesize vitamin C, but all other bats have to eat it. And I guess, especially in the uh, insectivore bats, that might be hard. So when we feed them on mealworms in captivity, uh, we should make sure that the mealworms in turn get enough uh, diversity in their, in their feeding. So for example, um, we feed our mealworms regularly with carrots and apples to make sure that the bats get enough vitamins. But um, so this is about vitamin C. About the other vitamins, uh, there's not much known. There is known that the plasma concentrations, so the, uh, the concentration in the blood of these bats differs among species. Um, so again, that's no surprise because the species are so different and their diets are so different. Um, but it also shows that they do rely on these vitamins. So they should be supplemented. Also, uh, the B vitamins, B6, B12, and folate, is, it's recommended to supplement uh, the bat's diet with this because uh, there have been reported cases of vitamin B12 deficiency in fruit bats along with all the neurological symptoms. Um, and I think the problem mostly with, uh, with fruit bats in captivity is that the cultivated fruit that we can feed them are A, uh, less rich in nutrients, and B, the variety is just not big enough. So in the wild, these bats have been shown to eat like 70 different species of plants. And I know from, from my lab where we work, we certainly do not feed them 70 different fruits. Hopefully in zoos, the variety is bigger. Um, but that's why it's important that we supplement them with vitamins. But the, uh, the interesting story with vitamin D is that very low levels seem sufficient. And when you think about it, it's actually not that surprising because bats are nocturnal. They literally never see the light. Now that's not true. Fruit bats live in trees where they are out also during the day. But most uh, insectivore species, they live in caves and they really, they only come out at night when it's really dark and they don't see the light and they don't like the light. So it's also been shown that bat skin has levels of vitamin D that are even lower than in the, in the furry part of the skin of cats and dogs that also never sees the light because it's covered. Um, also very low levels only of provitamin D have been found in the skin and also no other provitamins that would suggest that they use a different synthesis mechanism. Um, so they have vitamin D, but they seem to be okay with very low levels and the levels that they get, it's been suggested that they get these from ingesting uh, leaves and other plant parts. Um, it's also been shown that vitamin D, unlike in other mammals, does not play an important role in the calcium homeostasis in these food eating bats. And I'll get to that uh, in the next slide when I talk about the vitamin, uh, sorry, about the mineral demands in bats. So um, the first thing I want to talk about is iron because um, there have been several cases reported repeatedly in different species of flying foxes about iron storage disease. 
So uh, an excess intake or an excess uptake of iron, um, which can result in severe problems and even death in these bats. And especially when they're supplemented with vitamin C, um, which we want to do, but if we do that, um, the, the, the fruit bats, the food eating bats are at risk for this iron storage disease. But it has been shown that feeding them with uh, chelators, so uh, stuff that, that binds to the iron and blocks the absorption, could prevent iron storage disease. So, for example, um, supplementing them with tannic acids might help. Um, the uh, little I found on fluoride, except one case or several cases uh, in the same in the same zoo, I think, uh, where cases of fluorosis. So again, um, too much fluoride due to excess intake of fluoride. Um, so uh, for humans, and I guess also for other mammals, fluoride is important to prevent tooth decay. And if you think about it, especially the bats that eat a lot of sugar, we might think that they need a lot of fluoride. And in fact, it also little is known about how these bats prevent tooth decay. Um, and I've looked at a study where people investigated the, the pH value of saliva in bats. And interestingly, the saliva of insect eating bats is more basic, so has a higher pH than the one of fruit eating bats. So, and also the, the buffering capacity, so how well it, uh, it buffers against acids in the fruit is lower in the fruit eating bats than in the insect eating bats. So one explanation might be that these bats want to have a very acidic saliva to kill everything that might sit on the, on the fruit that they eat, even before it reaches the stomach. But it still remains basically a mystery how these bats um, prevent dental, um, uh, dental wear and like uh, damage from the acid that they ingest every day. Okay, um, and then I want to talk about calcium. And I think that is the one thing that all the literature is, uh, is clear upon is that calcium is in all bats the most limit limiting nutrient. So um, even in insectivores where you might think, and, and meat eaters where you might think that they uh, ingest a lot of uh, bone basically, and maybe even chitin, I thought that beetles, for example, would also be rich in calcium, but that is not the case. Um, so that is the most limiting nutrients, especially in pregnant bats, because they need to build up another body from scratch. So there, their, um, their calcium demand is very high. And same goes for hibernating bats, because then they don't have any food intake. Um, and it's been shown that what these bats do to satisfy these needs for uh, this higher need for calcium is that they do extensive bone remodeling. So they take out the calcium from their bones and make it accessible again. And it's been shown even that they reduce the bone density uh, in, the, in the long bones by up to 50%. And then in, in spring or after finishing uh, the gestation and lactation period, that then they have to, to feed uh, on a lot of calcium to refill their bones, basically. And so what bats do, um, sorry, what bats do is that they visit water holes and mineral licks. So both insect eating bats and food eating bats in the tropics, they have been shown to, uh, to fly over these, these water, water holes, or yeah, I guess some of them are made by like larger animals when they when they dig in the soil and then the rainwater collects um, and they preferentially visit water holes with hot water the problem is that they apparently cannot detect the difference whether it's hard because of uh, high calcium concentrations or high, high magnesium concentrations um, but it seems to work out so um, there was this one study with the insectivore bats um, where they showed that uh, also the excuse me, that also mostly 
lactating bats, female bats and juvenile bats were visiting these water licks. And um, I was curious, so I looked it up. Um, in this study, this water hole with the hard water, the calcium rich water had a concentration of 30 milligrams of calcium per liter. And um, as you live everywhere around the world, maybe you wanna look up the calcium content in your tap water. I can tell you that uh, where I live in Munich and the Munich area, the calcium concentration already is around 80 milligrams per liter. So I guess by feeding our bats just uh, or giving them water from the tab, we're already supplementing calcium quite a bit, um, which is maybe the reason why we have good success in breeding these bats. Um, but it also means that especially uh, if you're in, a, in an area where your tap water is low in calcium, you definitely need to supplement your bats with calcium. And that is best done um, with enriching the diet uh, in insectivores, the mealworms themselves. And I guess uh, in food eating bats, what we also do is we use this min mineral powder. Um, it's been reported in the wild that bats also visit uh, limestone rocks and lick them in caves. And we have offered these, uh, these to our bats also, but they don't use them. So I don't know if that's, like I said, because they already have enough calcium from the water. We have five minutes left, Fiona. Yeah, okay. Um, I'll be done soon. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll be done very soon, actually. So I just want to uh, come to a few specificities about these, uh, about certain groups of bats. So we start with the fruit bats and the fruit eating bats. Um, they have several digestive tract adaptations that I found very interesting. So uh, non surprisingly, they have fewer teeth and they are flat and broad because they need to crush their fruit. The only teeth that are still very piercy, as you can see, are the canines. Um, and then these bats have really big stomachs because they ingest uh, the fruit bats ingest a lot of juices and then they spit out the pulp, but the philostomid fruit eating bats, they ingest everything. Nonetheless, they have to eat a lot. So their stomachs are really big and they can, they can inflate quite a bit. And they also have very long intestines, the small intestines though. They do not have, uh, they have a large, no, they have a short, large intestine, no cecums, and they also don't have anything that would be uh, the ana analog to a rumen in, in, um, in cows, for example. And there's also been no trace of fermenting uh, bacteria been found. So it seems like they're doing all the digestion without the help of fermenting bacteria. Okay, um, so something I touched upon before was that in, in captivity, it might be difficult to give the fruit eating bats everything they need because most of the cultivated fruits are quite low in nutrients and that in the wild uh, they often consume a very big variety of fruits and also obviously with the season the offer uh, changes so like i think i've said this before um the jamaican fruit bed has been reported to feed on fruits from over 70 different genera of plants and I also said this before, I guess, that some of the fruit bats eat more than they would need in sugar to fulfill their protein needs. And the interesting thing is that you can also teach uh, fruit eating bats to eat vegetables. So um, you don't have to rely only on the different fruits that are available here, but we can also give them some vegetables like sweet potatoes or carrots. And they also, like I said, they, they eat leaves in the wild. And even my captive fruit eating bats, they eat salad. Not all the time. So sometimes they don't like it, but sometimes they're really crazy for it. So they, they love iceberg salad. Um, some, some friends who also work with bats have told me that they even eat cabbage. Uh, I guess you have to, all the time, you have to slowly introduce new foods. So don't give up after, if they haven't touched it after a couple of days, but um, yeah, they just need to get used to it. And in the end, they will basically eat anything you offer them. Okay, um, then 
some quick words about the, ins the insect eating bats. So this is a greater mouse-eared bat. This is their way of hunting, that they land on the ground and then they crunch away on these giant beetles or other uh, like centipedes. But it's also been shown now that they catch insects in the air. So we always learn new things. So when you eat insects, um, other pods usually consist of uh, up to 75% of chitin. And chitin in itself is a polysaccharide, so mostly carbs, but it has also nitrogen in it. And in terms of energy content, it's somewhere between protein and fat. Um, the question is, so when you look at the feces of insect eating bats, you see that it's glittering because it has a lot of these chitin pieces still in it. But actually, um, it's been shown on that in some bat species, they have the proteins to digest chitin directly. So even if they still uh, excrete a lot in the end, they are able to use really the, um, the energy that is in the chitin itself. Um, like I've said before, also um, insects are a very poor source of calcium, but on the other hand, high in phosphorus. So this uh, results in a bad uh, ratio of calcium to phosphorus, but you can shift this and very quickly also within 24 hours by supplementing the, the live insects that you feed to the bats with mineral supplements. So um, that means that while the body composition of insects is always relatively stable because the chitin won't change much, you can basically gut load the mealworms or other uh, insects that you feed them. One important uh, point I want to make is that in insect eating bats, you might want to look after their teeth. So this is a mouse yet bat. And like I said, they like to, uh, in the wild, they eat a lot of beetles. And since these, since all bats uh, are unusually long lived, so they can become up to 20, 30 years, which is huge for a tiny animal like this, um, they also wear down their teeth. So uh, I think this bat is relatively young, but you can already see that this canine here has lost its tip. This is from an older bat and you can see that the tear is really started. And most importantly, if you, if you feed mouse-eared bats on a diet only of soft insects without giving them beetles or crickets to crunch on, then they develop uh, sorry, then they can develop tartar. So again, this is very variable among species and we have to think about what would be the species natural diet and then try and mimic that as closely as possible in captivity. And now before I, I stop talking, I quickly wanna tell you something about vampire bats. Um, they are the only mammals on earth that exclusively feed on blood. So that's, that trait has evolved only once within the Chiroptera and finally, inside the, the family where we also find the fruit eaters. And um, as you can see in that image, also the, the bat is no longer a phyllostomate because it no longer has its knees, nose leaf because uh, they don't use echolocation anymore for finding their prey. They're instead listening for the breathing sounds. Also, very cool thing, vampire bats have heat sensors in their nose to detect where the blood is flowing the most under the skin. Um, yeah, and we have in total three species of vampire bats, all of which live in the tropics of America. And only one of them ear drinks mammal blood. That is the common vampire bat. Blood is a very challenging dietary source because it's about 78% of water. And then the, the rest what's left after you get rid of the water is mostly protein and only 1% of carbs. It also provides surprisingly low levels of vitamins. So yeah, eating blood is very challenging. First of all, when you start eating, you first have to ingest large volumes of liquid. So these bats, they're about uh, 15 grams in size. They also, or maybe 18 grams, they also drink about 12 to 15 milliliters of blood in one go. So what they do is they have this incredible kidney that immediately within five minutes starts uh, excreting the ex excess water. So then they urinate for up to two hours 
but within these two hours, it switched, the kidney switches from get rid of all the water mode to uh, get rid of all the protein and try to keep all the water. So these animals go from, I have way too much water to the conditions of a desert animal within an hour and a half. So also vampire bats are, you might think would be a risk of iron poisoning or like this iron storage disease, but they have the possibility to upregulate um, the hepcidine, which is important, uh, which is uh, responsible for the uptake of iron. So what vampire bats do is that they just don't take up the iron that they ingest into their organism. They just excrete it with the feces. Um, like I said before, the excess protein is also getting uh, being rid of by the, these really cool kidney adaptations that they have these highly uh, concentrated urine in the end. And there's one special thing is that, like I said, blood is very high in protein, but very low in everything else. They do not build up fat research. And if a vampire bat does not feed for three days, it's dead. So they have evolved this really cool uh, social altruism feat. So here you see that bats feed each other. So if you have a hungry bat, it will be approached by a donor bat, which then regurgitates some of the blood that it's eaten and the hungry bat can lick it off the donor bat, bat's mouth. And this is one of the textbook examples of social altruism because the reciprocity is not only among um, related individuals, but these bats kind of have yeah, blood sharing friends. There's a lot of interesting work that you can read on when you, when you Google Jerry Carter, for example. Okay, um, oops, one more thing. When you have these bats in captivity, they have social hierarchies. So you have to be sure that you, uh, you offer them enough different feeding bowls, or in this case, bird feeders. Sorry for the quality of the video. It's a bit flaky in the beginning. So this is dominant female bats chasing away the, um, the other bats, and they want to eat first. Although they have this food sharing, they also have this jealousy when it comes to who gets to feed first. And then it's also important that they hunt only in darkness. So as you saw, this video was uh, filmed with infrared lighting. So they don't really don't like light. They do not need the extra water, but they will take it. And the one important thing is that they need fresh blood because they do not learn taste aversions. So if you ever had food poisoning, you will probably never ever ingest that, that kind of food again, but vampire bats would do so because they do not learn what's bad for them. They don't know the concept of bad blood. So they always need fresh blood and it needs to be taken out of uh, their aviary as soon as they're finished with it after about two, three hours. Okay, so I hope I didn't go over time too much. Um, I'll come to an end now. I thank you very much for your attention. And I have one personal matter for you in the very end because uh, my current lab, we are closing down our small Philostomus discolor colony. We have about 18 individuals and we're looking for a good place for them. So if your zoo maybe already has them or some other bats, uh, maybe get into contact with Dr. Holger Gerlitz and maybe they can find a new home with you. So here are your questions. I'll let you work through them. Okay. Pick and choose and if you, you know, if you can't answer any, that's absolutely fine. So do you want me to read the You don't have to use a sequence, you just pick what you want. Okay, okay. Uh, would you recommend artificially increased calcium levels in water? Um, I think I can start every, every answer I give from today, uh, today with the words, depends on the species. Um, I would say in food eating bats, not so much because they probably don't uh, ingest that much water. But in the insect eaters, why not? Although it's probably an easier method to, like I said, to gut load uh, the insects that you feed to them. Also with the vitamins and nutrients in water, you always have the problem that you can barely control how much of it they actually use. Whereas with the food, uh, yeah, they have to basically. Um, Fruit bats with metabolic bone disease, is it no use to provide UV light? 
Um, in fruit beds, I would guess that it could help because like I said, these beds, they live uh, in the wild, they live in trees, so they have uh, access to sunlight. I'm not a specialist uh, on this here, so I, I cannot give a, def a definite answer to this, I'm sorry. Um, I would say in, in fruit bats, it might help, but um, since the, the vitamin D does not have to, to ha have that much effect on, on their bone metabolism, maybe the vitamin D is not the problem, but maybe rather the calcium. But I'm not a vet, so take this with caution. Okay, uh, the next question is, are mealworms really a good staple diet? Or would you not go for a variety of other insects? Um, yes and no. So I think mealworms are a great staple diet, but it really is important that the mealworms themselves have a good diet. So only feeding them on oat flakes will probably make your bats uh, deprived in, in something. So you have to, to give the mealworms a good diet. Like I said, different, uh, different vegetables and fruits for the vitamins and other nutrients. Um, not just oat, oatmeal, but maybe also cornflakes or uh, other dried things, uh, full cereal, vollkorn basically. Um, and also, like I said, you have to gut load them with the mineral supplements. So that said, um, because for some mealworms can definitely be a good staple diet because some insectivore bats, they won't eat anything else unless you want to really um, go catch moths all the time and give them, give them butterflies or give them mosquitoes. Um, I think it's just not possible realistically to feed some bats anything else but mealworms. But like I also said, um, for example, the mouse eat bats and all, mostly all the bigger insectivore species, they, uh, they can hunt bigger food uh, insects like crickets, grasshoppers, all of that you uh, can also feed um, cockroaches, I think. Um, but in general, I think people have been highly successful in even keeping Aptesicus fuscus bats, which are bigger, bigger insectivore bats, solely on mealworms without any other uh, feeding insects, as long as the mealworms are being fed uh, with a variety of foods and get the supplements. That's a really good point. I think we've probably got time for one more question, although I'm sure okay. we could all talk bats all morning. <laughs> oh, this one I like. How does the long tongue of the nectar feeding bat fits, fit inside their body? Um, that is a really spooky thing because <laughs> the tongue doesn't start in the, in the throat because it actually starts in the chest of the bat. So, and then I guess you can also, I mean, our, our tongue can be longer than in the mouth, um, out of the mouth by about twice as high. So I guess um, this, this is how it works. And I see the one, one last question because it asked uh, specifically, do you recommend to apply oil for fatty acids? Yes, uh, I can recommend that at least for the bats that I know, um, they will take it on just basically dip the mealworm in the fatty and the fatty acids and then they eat that all together. They love that. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Leonie. These pellets and flakes, we normally just toss them in, uh, as we also do with the frozen food. I will show you up there how we do this right now. In many ways, conventional feeding. Uh, if we want to give them the green feeds, we mainly look to the land plants. I don't think that's a very good choice because many of these fish are not capable of breaking down the cellulose. But there are several ways of making uh, a little change, and that's trying to get the seaweeds in. You can find them in many ways. This, for example, is a defrozen uva. 
This is even uh, aquacultured, so it's uh, from a very clean system. You can also still get them from the sea. This is dried ulva. And over here we have dried uh, saccharina, which is a brown seaweed. In an attempt to make a whole feed, we made our own food. Uh, these are all different kinds of seaweed binded with achar. Achar is made uh, of red seaweeds and brown seaweeds, which makes it a perfect candidate for dough fish uh, instead of gelatine, which is mostly uh, from hick boats, of course. And in this way, we could make a 100% aquacultured vegan fish feed for our fish. One of the advantages that you have working with Akhar is that you can make it in different shape and form if you want. So normally we can make this uh, for the trophies, but we can also make it like this and we call these the grazing stones. So we have the the ones that we also use in the aquarium and we hang them in and then they can graze like they do in the wild and you can see that it takes way longer for them to eat all the food um, we even have some tanks where they are busy for more than half an hour and over there you can see one of the ones that we put in this morning this way we know that they can express their grazing behavior a tiny little bit This one is still from plastic um, and it's an okay solution but the fish could get plastic in their stomachs so we thought we'd do it another way. We made our own 3D model so we printed this ourselves. Um, it's made from seaweed and, uh, and corn and it's a feeding rack for fish. So what we basically did is we try to make it in, in two ways. You can click the top part off and put seaweed in between. Seaweed floats, otherwise it would be at the top of your aquarium and the fish still wouldn't graze as they would do in a while. Or, as we did in this time, you can put the gelatine on top and let it sink through the holes and in this way uh, we can make sure that the fish have a more difficulty to graze the feed off. Here you see our bad fish and banner fish pulling the seaweed out of the 3D structure. You see the purple tanks at the back, they try to get it out too, but they're just not able to compete with the bigger fish. By adjusting the length, width and depth of the holes in the structures, we can make sure the grazing fish which all have different beaks and methods to get their food, get a more specific diet. Here you see a new version of the feeding rack. We made the holes a little bit smaller to make sure the bad fish can get it out anymore. Now you see the timid purple tanks also at the feeding stone. This is a huge advantage for us. The diet of the purple tank contains more than 90% of algae in the wild. Now we can make sure that at least they can get as much food as we think is necessary for these fish. 
our work is far from over. I really hope more animal nutritionists and behaviorists are getting involved to make sure that we give our reef fish the best life possible in captivity. That was brilliant. Thank you, Sandra. And that uh, video quality is really up the game there, having live video clips in. So uh, really nicely produced as well. Um, so our next talk will be uh, from Challing Hoseman, and he is the acting manager at Van Hall Lorenstein University of Applied Sciences. And the talk will be on uh, Europe, uh, sorry, ENG nutrition workshop in uh, Kaliningrad. And this talk is approximately 10 minutes. And I believe um, at the end in the Q&A session, uh, Yuka will be taking uh, questions for Chani. Depending on which time zone you are in, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Yuka Nijboer, and myself, Charlie Huisman, would like to share our experiences in designing and carrying out the Kaliningrad Zoo Nutrition course. Moreover, we also would like to stress again the importance of zoo animal nutrition education towards zoo staff. Um, Kaliningrad Zoo has a long and also rather eventful history. It started 125 years ago as Konigsberg Zoo. Uh, presently, it is of course Kaliningrad Zoo and uh, is one of the largest Rus Russian zoos. Kaliningrad is situated between Lithuania and Poland. Yeah. And uh, from Kaliningrad Zoo, the is its signature animal because it is an important part of its history. It shows the present entrance of the Zoo. I would like to start uh, with telling you how it all started. The director of Kaliningrad Zoo identified the need for an upgrade of nutrition knowledge of the staff. She contacted EASA and finally was brought in contact with the ENG chair Anouk Vens. Anouk Vens asked Juke Nijboer, former zoo nutritionist of Rotterdam Zoo, and Charling Huisman, former lecturer animal nutrition, and both ENG members from its start onwards to uh, prepare and carry out the course. And since we were both available and also willing, we said yes. And we started preparing. First thing we did was uh, contacting our contact person, obviously, and ask her to uh, collect questions from the staff. Of course, nutrition collected, uh, connected questions from the staff. And we got quite a variety collection, some very straightforward and some uh, rather complicated. Uh, for instance, the question in the middle about weight changes uh, uh, related to various physiological conditions. Well, if you study this question, you will agree with me that it, this requires quite a lot of extensive uh, research to answer it uh, properly. So we decided to translate this to the need for body condition scoring and some more knowledge on how to use body condition scoring as part of zoo animal nutrition management. After collecting these questions, we discussed those questions, uh, doing of course some research and uh, uh, compiled a list of answers to those questions and sent those questions, by the way, back to the zoo. Uh, the question, as uh, were as said, discussed and researched in the weeks before the course, and we used the answers, of course, also to design the three days course based on those questions and also previous experiences, and of course, what we knew about the collection. And after arrival in the zoo, we started with an extensive zoo visit to get to know stakeholders and get an impression of animals, enclosures, and feedstuffs used. And we used this final information to lay out the final draft of the course and the course has three key features theory with reference to the questions and of course the zoo situation and its specific animals 
diet assessment using real diets from the zoo and based on zootrition calculations. And on the last day, we did some more uh, a more practical approach with body condition scoring and uh, similar topics. This is an impression of the zoo tour where we went behind the screens. And this is an example of the program, uh, or not an example, in fact, it is the first day of the program. And there you can observe a mixture of theory, for instance, about digestive systems and its relation to the diet, but also quite a lot already about zootrition and uh, assessing diets. And we did even more of that stuff, zootrition stuff, on the second day. The course. There were approximately 30 participants, mainly Kaliningrad Zoo staff, including directors, but there were also representatives from other Russian zoos. And we used simultaneous translation, or we were, we were offered simultaneous translation, which made it possible uh, for the participants to listen to the course in their own language, Russian. And beforehand, uh, our PowerPoints were translated also in Russian. We started the course with a small quiz. And here's an example of a quiz question uh, where they could agree or disagree. So it was more a statement than a question. We showed our, we showed our participants a pile of concentrate and uh, after showing this picture we asked them to agree or disagree. It is an attritional crime to sell this, which was shown on the picture, as complete feed for elephants or other large herbivores. And they could uh, use a state of the art system to show agreement or disagreement. And this picture shows uh, how we practiced this method. So green means uh, agree and red means disagree. Some impressions of the course. This is uh, the feed stuff we discussed uh, extensively, I can say. So we talked about the use, about alternatives, about uh, the necessity, etc. where you can use it, uh, for which animal they were su suitable and not suitable, etc. This is uh, Yuka pointing out some issues towards our course participants. This is Yuka with uh, a sample of the extensive uh, stock of dried uh, browse leaves. Here. Uh, uh, raccoons, uh, which might be a little bit overweight, but then of course we did body condition scoring. This is uh, body condition scoring uh, in theory. We showed them an awful lot of pictures of uh, animals in various stages uh, of condition if, uh, and asked them to score. And uh, five fingers means uh, extremely fat and one finger means emaciated. This is us signing the, uh, the uh, certificates. Uh, this is uh, an example of the certificate. And this is a proud uh, owner of the certificate and of course one of the course participants. After the course we did uh, an extensive evaluation and uh, since we were there everybody was uh, quite uh, satisfied with the course, in fact they were very satisfied with the course, but we thought it would be wise to ask them also about how they felt about the course about a year later. So we uh, approached them with a list of questions a few weeks ago and they reported back that uh, the, the good points from the course were that the teams felt more informed and aware and uh, with this course, we partly solved the knowledge gap due to lack of specialized education in zoo animal nutrition and other zoo-related uh, uh, issues in Russia. Uh, there were um, quite a few diet changes, more leaves in Columbus diets, introduction of alfalfa in giraffe diets for the first time, removal of unnecessary feed items, more browse for browsers and less browse for grazers, which uh, is of course related, grass at libitum for grazers and the reduction of grains and concentrates, which is of course uh, all good practice. Key success factor uh, is probably, uh, although difficult to point out, the availability of 
uh, simultaneous translators because simultaneous translation, uh, you could say that nothing beats the transfer of information in a modern language. Take home message. Well, this presentation is not about sharing a nice experience abroad. It was a nice experience, by the way. But it will emphasize again that next to research, continuous education is a key factor in improving zoo animal nutrition. We tend to overlook this. Educated zookeepers are important. They observe and report and ultimately decide what ends up in the animal's bowl. Therefore, well-informed zookeepers and other zoo staff means also better nutrition. I would like to thank Svetlana Sokolova, the director of Kaliningrad Zoo, for inviting us and being our host. Maria Koziakova, our contact person who did a lot of work for us. Our simultaneous translators and all participants who were very enthusiastic and nice to work with. We would like to thank you for your attention and if you have further questions about our course, uh, we invite you to send us a mail on the mail addresses uh, presented on this slide. Thank you for listening. So our next talk is by Vanda McCormick and she is the head of animal and agriculture at Hartbury University in the UK and her talk is on uh, the sourcing of feeder animals for snakes in UK zoos. from Harper University and I'm going to be talking about a project on the sourcing of feeder animals for snakes by UK zoos that was undertaken by an undergraduate student Kelsey Jones uh, alongside my co-supervisor Gavin Cook when I was associated with Anglia Ruskin University. Now the estimated UK pet snake numbers range anywhere from 200,000 upwards plus there's obviously many more in zoological institutions and educational establishments. Most of these animals are being fed frozen thawed deceased animals. Live feeding is highly discouraged, although it's not illegal if supported by veterinary advice and ethical review has been undertaken and it happens away from public viewing. But interestingly, there's, there's no specific legislation covering the husbandry of feeder animals beyond the general needs under provision in the Animal Welfare Act. There are provisions made within the Animal Scientific Procedures Act that outline the humane killing methods for feeder animals for reptiles that are involved in research, but not for feeder animals for reptiles outside of that sector. There's an incredibly wide range of species of snakes being held in the UK privately and in um, institutions open to the public that display different sizes, different dietary needs. Corn snakes and royal pythons are, re are reportedly the most popular species most popular giant species and so we'd expect that most of the feeder animals being sourced would be rodents typically rats and mice however to date there's no knowledge of what types of feeder animals are being fed where they're sourced from or the reasons for this choice and that was what we were trying to look at within this study now <clears throat> the method we undertook was to go through an online survey which ran through online surveys and was distributed widely by email to um, pet shops, reptile shops, colleges and zoos, as well as through closed snake hobbyist groups on social media sites like Facebook and to pet keepers and private breeders. We ran the survey for 152 days back crossing from 2018 to 2019 and all respondents had to be at least 18 years old and responsible for the care of at least one snake. We fully anonymised the data so no personal details were collected. And the survey consisted of um, 20 different items, predominantly asking things like what type of keeper was, was re replying, the species that they, they kept, what species of food they were providing, where they got that food and why they'd made those decisions. And obviously this was all ethically approved from Anglia Ruskin University. And we also gained support from the Viaza Research Engagement Group to, um, before circulating to, to the zoos. Now, in terms of the results, we received 651 full responses. All I'm talking about today is the, the specific findings in relation to both Biaza Zoo employees and non Biaza Zoo employees. So we had 11 and 7 of those respectively. 
We weren't surprised to find that the most common species reported in the zoos were pretty much the same as we were getting from the private collectors. So corn snakes, royal pythons and boa constrictors were the top three species being held, along with a variety of other common ones such as um, rainbow boas, carpet pythons, king snakes, western hognose, that kind of thing. There were around 17 more species specifically named under the other categories, as well as five common names that couldn't be tied down to a particular species. But it starts to show the variation that we were getting that zoos are having to deal with in feeding. Now, when looking at the food types that were being provided, um, the zoos have a much narrower range of um, food species that they're actually providing to their snakes. There was uh, no mention of feeding things like amphibians, other snakes, lizards, um, reptilinks, which are a meat based food source or invertebrates, eggs, that kind of thing that we were seeing from the private keepers. Um, almost all of the food from zoos was being sourced from wholesalers, with a few exceptions, as opposed to private keepers using pet shops, reptile shops and online. So the exception was a zoo who was breeding their own rats and mice to feed and another breeding their own mice, multi mammoth mice and fish. I'll come back to that later. One Biaza zoo that sourced rabbits from a gamekeeper and then from the non Biaza zoos, one that sourced their feed, which was mice, rats and rabbits specifically from a reptile shop, one that additionally gained chickens from a farm, and one that sourced all of their food species online, which was everything listed in this table other than fish. Now, in terms of the reasons that people were giving for these food choices, in private keepers, convenience and cost were by far the, um, the predominant things in there. And again, we wouldn't be surprised to see convenience and cost factoring highly within zoological institutions as well. Of the two Biaza zoos that had stated previously that they were breeding their own feeder animals in some cases, they had both declared that there was no alternative as one of the reasons they were given. In an, in an Iaza zoo, zoo nutrition meeting, it's a little bit sad to say that not, no Biaza zoos declared nutritional value to be a reason behind their diet choice. Um, but I suppose on a more positive side, none of the collections declared concerns about cleanliness being a factor influencing where they, what they fed and where they got it from. We did have a couple of additional reasons coming from Biaza collections, one being that they were tied into an existing supply contract and the other being the sheer number of animals that they were having to feed. Um, despite there being no nutritional specific factor identified, actually five of the 11 Biaza zoos did also um, declare that they were supplementing on top of the animals, so with uh, vitamin mineral powders, and three of the seven non-Biaza zoos were doing the same. Now, I suppose in terms of final thoughts, this is just a sip, as I say, but we're seeing similar trends in species popularity, but the factors that affect feeder animals provided to snakes in UK zoo collections are very different to those stated by private keepers. And despite the popularity in collections, nutrition based decisions on snake diet are still very lacking and a much greater focus is needed not only on the nutritional needs of captive snakes, but also on what it means in a real world setting for institutions to actually provide those diets. Obviously, I'd like to thank Biaza's research engagement group for supporting the project and all of the respondents who took part. And I'm happy to take questions and I'll leave you to look at the list of all the additional species that took that were declared within the report. Thank you very much. Brilliant. That was a great uh, talk there. And once again, feel free to put questions in the chat to ask at the end. And so the next video is from the ENG's own Marcus Klaus. Marcus is the professor at Zurich University. And his talk is on uh, breeding your food rats, a productive alternative to lab style cage systems. Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining the digital conference. I'm giving this talk on behalf on, of Andreas Wigger, Daria Singh and Jan Loy from the Wildnis Park, Zurich, who invented the system I'm going to present it to you. I just saw it and I asked them whether I can present it at the conference. This started with a typical dilemma that a lot of people might feel that work with animals. You take pride in exhibiting animals in naturalistic and complex enclosures, like for a monitor lizard, or for your raptors, or for a small felid like a serval. And you also take pride in feeding them on whole prey, at least that's what we often do in Europe. So you have your monitor eating a rat, or your raptor eating a rat, or your felid eating a rat. But you try normally you blend out the question, where do these prey animals come from? If you don't mind or if you don't care, they most likely come from a production system like this one, typically used for breeding rats for laboratory purposes or for feeding. 
and we tend to forget that prey animals are animals first and only prey secondarily. So at the Wildnis Park Zurich, this is how they were producing their own food rats for the different animals on display. And now they changed that to this system that I want to explain to you because I felt it was quite impressed. So this is a four by four meter room that has a lot of furniture inside that looks chaotic and the rats can basically arrange it as they want by themselves. There's this clean area where there is a water basin and the drinking trough. And then you have the feeding boxes in front that have the red plastic so the rats cannot actually see you observing them. Where the food is presented and they have to enter them and you can remotely close them and then open the lid and take out the rats that you want to harvest on any particular day. So this would be a look into the feeding boxes where food is provided ideally in such a way that the rats cannot take it out but that they eat it inside. And they don't only get to listen to music but they have this remote system with the wires that you see there so that you can lock them into the feeding boxes. You evidently only take out young animals, you don't take out the pregnant females. This is something that you have to um, get a feeling for. And apart from harvesting animals on a daily basis, you do a full clean out of the whole room maybe once a year so that everything get clean again and you take out all the surplus that has accumulated during that time because you're never gonna you're probably not going to keep this at the same carrying capacity on a constant basis. You might at that stage bring in genetically new animals, for example, new males into the system. And the feeding boxes in the clean area evidently have to be cleaned on a daily basis. That's just as you would normally do it. So there's this clean area with a water basin for bathing and the drinking water that you would clean regularly. But the other stuff is left untouched and it's a chaos where the red arrange for themselves. Evidently, the animals you don't want to harvest, like for example, the um, breeding females, you treat them very gently so they're not afraid of you. They don't even bother if you open the feeding boxes and they're in there, so they're not afraid. And the red plastic evidently helps, like this red is not aware that I'm photographing it at this stage. For example, over the course of more than one year, starting with two males and 20 females, at a harvest of 20 rats per week, at clean out there was a surplus of 300 animals or in another year with a smaller starting group four males and only five females harvest about nine animals per week and at the end a surplus of 200 animals you might think about improving this so you might have a different system of remotely closing the boxes so that the animals are even less aware that you are approaching you might make the entrance to the feeding box a little bit more complicated so they can get out less easily. And you evidently might have more than a single of these enclosures so that you have a very reliable production for every single day that you want rats. And you could actually have your visitors have a look in there. For example, you could make this exit a little bit more complicated. So to sum up, it's not only having beautiful enclosures for your display animals, it's also having enclosures that are naturalistic and where the animals can perform their own behavior with sufficient space. And I was, would end this with a typical note of the old Samuel Fuller movie, Run of the Arrow. The end of the story will be written by you because the question is, will you take that or not? I thank you for your attention. And of course, I thank the Wildness Park for Zurich for allowing me to show this. I want to end with a philosophical note here. What's the difference between keeping prey animals in a decent way that's appropriate for the species and running actually a breed and cull system? Because that's what it is. If you keep your prey animals in a nice way, this is like having a breed and cull system. And don't tell me that a rat is inferior to a giraffe. If you don't mind where your prey animals come from, you might have systems like that. No difference for your display animals, but the prey animals might come from much worse systems. So breed and cull, in my view, is the ideal thing for both, not only the display animals, but also for the prey animals. I thank you for your attention. Another great talk, really interesting food for thought, thought there. I think that rat enclosure might be nicer than my house. Um, so our final talk is from uh, the ENG's chair, Anouk Fens. She is a zoo nutritionist at Appenhall and Rotterdam Zoo. 
and her talk is on uh, stimulation, stimulating natural foraging behaviours in primates through new exhibit design for, uh, for local biodiversity. Got it out in the end. Hello everyone, my name is Anouk and I am nutritionist working in Apeho Primal Park uh, in the Netherlands. And in the next 10 minutes, I would like to um, walk with you in our new food forest. Um, and we'll tell you a little bit more about this new enclosure that we designed last year in our zoo um, that is focusing on the stimulation of natural foraging behavior of our primates, um, but also stimulating our local biodiversity. Well, Primate Park uh, in the Netherlands is a primate-focused zoo. And we are housing a unique collection of uh, almost 40 primate species. We are um, located in the middle of, uh, of the Netherlands, close to um, um, one of our largest nature reserves, as you can see here on the, on the map, um, which is a very rich, nature-rich and forest-rich uh, area. Um, we are therefore known of our large and naturalistic uh, enclosures. And as you can see, the primates uh, make use of the trees and their, um, uh, all the surroundings we have. Um, furthermore, most of our primates are free roaming. So uh, we have a lot of walkthrough uh, enclosures um, in which the visitors encounter the primates very close. Um, as you can see here, in order to give them a um, great experience. Um, we are constantly looking for new um, innovative ideas um, in terms of housing our primates, um, walkthrough exhibits, large nat naturalistic exhibits, that is what we do already for years. Um, but now we try to go to a next level and therefore our food forest had three new goals. Um, first, um, we wanted to stimulate uh, the natural foraging behavior of the primates that would live in this area. Um, we all know that in the wild, animals and uh, primates, in primates in particular, spend a lot of time in, uh, on foraging. Some of the primate species we keep in our zoo spend 8 to 12 hours uh, foraging. But in zoos, of course, we cannot offer this in the way we would, uh, we would like to do. Um, they are uh, fed some three, four, five times a day, uh, but we cannot stimulate uh, the natural uh, situation. Um, and the lack of time spent on foraging may result, of course, um, in uh, unwanted behaviors like stereotype behavior or abnormal behavior. Um, and our second goal or our second challenge was to stimulate the local biodiversity of the area um, and especially of the zoo. Um, as a conservation organization, uh, both ex situ and also in situ, uh, we feel of course very responsible also for the small organism living in our zoo or in the area where our, where our zoo is located. And therefore we try to stimulate local biodiversity and especially give it a new boost. Um, and of course, needless to say, we wanted to inspire and educate our visitors uh, but then mainly on this team biodiversity. Um, so tell them about the importance, importance but also the complexity uh, of biodiversity uh, and provide them, for example, with tools uh, and information how they could contribute in increasing the biodiversity in their own backyard. So how did it look like, this food forest? Um, well, it was a mixed uh, exhibit um, with several uh, Calatricid and New World, species, uh, New World primate species. Um, as you can see here, um, we keep in this enclosure uh, pie tamarinds, silvery marmosets, um, golden-headed lion tamarinds, and two um, smaller uh, New World primate species, the red titi monkey and the um, uh, white-faced sagi. Um, like many of our enclosures, it was again a free roaming or walkthrough exhibit, so the visitor, visitors could en encounter the animals uh, from pretty close. And again, the two main goals of this new enclosure were stimulation of natural feeding behavior, especially in terms of um, foraging on insects, um, and boost the local biodiversity of the area. 
So what did we do? Well, actually we did a lot. Um, and here I only mentioned some uh, things that, that happened. Um, uh, first, uh, the complete landscape uh, was designed in order to attract uh, small invertebrates, small mammals um, to the area, um, of which most of them are already present in the area. Um, at one part of the enclosure, we add uh, a large moat um, as, an, as an exhibit barrier, um, but using it as a beginning point of ecological su succession. Um, many uh, native flowers, plants, bushes, um, trees were planted, um, of which many are edible and safe to use by the primates, um, especially uh, in terms of the herbs. But of course, um, the flowers and also the herbs were also used to attract um, small invertebrates to the area. Um, and both in the inside and in the outside enclosure, we placed several uh, insects, uh, especially mealworm uh, and gum dispensers, um, um, where the primates could feed whenever they wanted. Um, but actually the most fancy thing that we built in this enclosure, and this is actually the main attraction, is our big um, insect hotel. Uh, we built an exhibit barrier that uh, functions as a major insect hotel. Um, it consists actually of two separate walls, both present in the outside and in the inside enclosure of the animals. And uh, it has a total length of over 100 meters long. Um, the wall was designed by several e ecological experts um, in order to stimulate, but also support um, the species that are already present in the area, uh, such as the beetles, uh, caterpillars, uh, grasshoppers, some bee species, wood lice, uh, but even small reptiles, uh, birds and small mammals that are present um, in the area. Well, we hope that, them, that they also um, will make use of the... Um, uh, of the wall. Uh, here are some more pictures. Um, so it was completely designed for them um, and um, based on the fact that they will use it for uh, either shelter, uh, hibernation or reproduction. And at the same time, of course, it is um, a tool to stimulate the insect foraging behavior uh, or foraging time um, of, the, of the primate species. Um, this enclosure was opened just recently, uh, like last summer. Um, so all primates are now in it. We are still working on introduction. Uh, everything goes very well. Uh, it has been opened for, for visitors at the last few months, uh, whenever possible, of course, for uh, in terms of Corona. Uh, so it's pretty new. And um, you can see that in the, in the enclosure because the trees and the shrubs and the herbs, they are still, of course, very, very young. Um, uh, but also the insect wall, it's, it's getting used by some insects, insects, but of course that needs a lot of time, which simply means that um, for us in the next few years, um, we need some time to um, evaluate um, our goals um, and of course to collect data. Um, so we are, are of course are very curious about the development of the biodiversity um, in this enclosure uh, with the native uh, vegetation, but also in and around the wall. Um, but of course, also the use of insects, um, of the use of primates in terms of foraging behavior, in terms of insects feeding in the enclosure, and especially again um, at the wall. Um, so of course, uh, data will be collected on, on this type of behavior. And at the end, of course, we hope that it will increase foraging behavior first, uh, especially for the smaller uh, marmoset species, um, but maybe we can even um, uh, go to a diet change um, if, if, if it seems that the animals are um, uh, using the wall or foraging on, or insects in a large part of their day, um, we can even, uh, for example, decide to feed them less insects in summertime because they're uh, feeding insects all day long uh, by themselves. But of course, that is future. Um, and for now, we, yeah, we just need to start collecting data first. So maybe at the next conference, I can show a little bit more. Um, but I, I just wanted to tell you about this, uh, I think, fantastic new enclosure and, uh, and the steps that we have made. Um, 
So thank you for your attention. If you have any questions about this project, then please send me an email or um, put your question in the, um, um, in the chat box so I can answer it at the end of this, uh, this session. Thank you again. Fantastic. Really brilliant session there. I really enjoyed that. Quite uh, short and snappy, um, but we got through them all. And um, the programme now says that um, from 12.30 to 1.30 there's lunch, but we thought if obviously people are happy to go to lunch, but if people are still keen to ask questions, we could spend 10 minutes um, just answering some questions that have come up. So I think Marcus is sharing his screen again. Um, so if our presenters are there and would like to unmute themselves, um, maybe we could start off with questions uh, to Sander on uh, vegan fish. Are you there, Sander? Or yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes. Brilliant. Fab. Um, the first one is, uh, how do I check if seaweed comes from sustainable culture is to try to get them locally. So all of the ones that you saw in the video, we know that they're either from a closed system or from a research facility in the southern part of Holland. It's called Sealand and you have a uh, have very much research facilities over there where you can actually see where they're coming from. And uh, we don't use gelatin, we use agar. Um, I also put it in the, in the notes already. It's uh, from Schuurman, it's a Dutch company too. And we put the agar with water of 90 degrees and then afterwards when it's cooled down a little we put the water combined with the agar with the the mix of the micro and macro algae that we think is right now but we have to do very much analysis to make sure that we get in the in the straight lines because there's yeah it's it's planned so it's not always the same uh nutrient uh balance as we as we hope for and how do we feed carnivorous fish in the same display? Um, what we do is, is we already had the, the, the normal trophies as you saw in the video, and we hang in these stones now in these exhibits. And in many zoos, we already look at the fish as in more of the carnivorous way. So what I wanted to do is try to make a zero point by making this vegan fish feed. And then from there, start looking back at what other fish do we have uh, to make sure that we get more balance between the herbivores, omnivores, and carnivores fish. And I see questions coming up now. Yeah, Celsius, that's true. 90 degrees Celsius to mix the agar. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, and so, and then on to the alternative rat production. So I believe that's you, Marcus. Yeah, thank that you. So the first question would be, can you also harvest pinkies in this system? And with this system as it is, you cannot, because the females have their litters somewhere in the chaos in the backside. So that is, um, you could consider that a downside. The other two questions I think are linked. So was there a cost benefit to this new system? And I want to stress that the driver was not cost. The driver was, the incentive was to increase the welfare of the prey animals. And maybe this is a different philosophy depending on where you are, but the point that everybody wanted to make there is you cannot treat prey animals as if they are just food, as if they are just grass or hay that you order. They're alive as well. Everybody knows they are conscious animals. So you have, you want to look after them. So increase in productivity, that question, in some years it was better than the old system. In some years it was worse. So there's no clear line there. The benefit is not necessarily the productivity. How do you communicate breed and cull? Um, there is on different levels in the zoo community, I think we need we should tackle this. On your individual zoo level, you should think about communication strategies, not like, what am I doing next week about this? But you should make a plan, something like, 
okay, in two years, I want to be able to tell the public that I'm culling a zebra. And in five years, I want to be able to tell the public that I'm going to cull surplus primate. But the question always is, if you are something, if you have something, or if you're a person that, com that will ingest meat in some form, you always have to ask, how did the animal that produced this meat live? And if you have this under your control in your own facility, you can ensure really good quality of life for that animal that provides the meat. And to be able to say that, I want to feed meat that is produced in a very good quality of life way is much better than just buying in a supermarket somewhere. And I think you should, um, you can direct communication strategies that way. Over and out. I think the same can be said for feeder insects as well, actually. There's kind of been a lot of uh, research done a bit going back to what Leone says about you kind of get out what you put in. So treating them well and feeding them well uh, bring, gives you an overall better quality feeder item. Um, and then uh, Anouk, if you're there, we've got a couple of questions on primate foraging, one on the slide and I think one uh, in the chat we'll try and find for you. Yeah, um, hi everyone. Just starting with the one that's mentioned by Marcus about the gum dispenser. Well, I have to disappoint you all since there was a very fancy design, but we are still working on that. So at this moment it's just some gum um, that is um, uh, like in a rocky uh, solid format uh, that is uh, hidden in the tree trunks or in the wall that is in the enclosure. So the animals have to look for it in type of natural way, but it is not like some kind of machine that is um, um, dispensing the gum in, in several uh, or in, um, um, in in some moments during the day. Um, but I hope hopefully when I come back with some more data, maybe in one or two years, um, I can give an update on this. Great, thanks Anouk. And there's just uh, one I noticed in the chat from Katie. Does the insect will make it harder to monitor the amounts the animals are eating? and to be able to make sure that they're all getting the correct nutritional requirements. Yeah, I'm happy you, you pointed out because she is completely right. And if I would have more time, I could focus a little bit more on that. Uh, because even though we would like to focus on this, um, on this question, uh, again, yes, uh, it's very hard to, um, uh, to do some or to collect some data on what they specifically eat. At the moment, we are conducting some trials with students to see whether it is possible to even uh, determine which insects are uh, living in the wall and then which are um, uh, are catched by the primates but for now most of the time it's just a wing or one little leg that is still somewhere hanging out of a, <laughs> a small primate mouth um, so it's, it's a very hard one so we also on here we need some more time but the, the idea is there the enclosure is there and I'm sure in the upcoming uh, years we will collect more data on this a brilliant idea and I just like some of the talks we've had is just it, they're just really fantastic new ways to bring new ideas and kind of update zoo, zoo knowledge technology welfare standards so thank you all for contributing and influence yeah, there we go. behavior and feather quality in ostriches so the case takes place on an ostrich farm. They keep animals for educational reasons, and it is one big group of 40 animals aging from one year to 24 years. The main problem was feather pecking and plucking, as well as historically white feathers. The ostriches are group fed um, between three and five times a day, depending on the availability of food, and is a diet of grains and pellets with the not fixed ratio, which also changes over the years and over the months. An additional problem is that the animals do not really like the ostrich pellets and that the ostrich pellets break and powder, which the animal do not eat. So there is always a lot of leftovers. The diet in 2015, I want to roll this case up historically, um, consisted of barley plus corn, beans, and carob flowers, as well as fresh fruit and vegetables. And as you can imagine, this diet is low in structured fiber and high in highly digestible carbohydrates, as well as low in protein and sulfur-containing amino acids, vitamins, and minerals. 
So there were white feathers and feather plucking from 2015 to 2019, which you can see here on these two images. So in April 2019, there was the first contact uh, to the Institute and the following recommendations were made to add uh, roughage to increase the structured fiber content and if possible choose alpha alpha because of the high protein content and amino acid bioavailability as well as high calcium content. Um, then to add pellets, alpha alpha if possible and some ostrich pellets to ensure trace mineral and vitamin supplementation, reduce the fruits and the grains in the diet and add a fat source for fatty acids. Nutritional aspects of feather pecking and plucking that are very well known from poultry are a deficiency in protein and certain amino acids, especially the sulfur containing ones, a lack of well structured fiber and a low sodium content. It has to be said that nutrition often only is one aspect of the whole problem and that behavioral issues and stress can excavate problems. So in November, we did a nutritional consultation and calculation of the current ration, which then consisted mainly of wheat and alpha alpha pellets, um, plus uh, 10 to 15 kilo fresh alpha alpha for the whole group of 40 animals. Um, after calculating the ration, we compared it to the recommended literature and saw that the protein content was at the lower end of the recommendation, which can be problematic because there were also young and growing animals in the group, and that essential amino acids, mainly alkenine and leucine, were below the recommendations, and that vitamins and minerals were below the recommendations as well. So we ended up recommending the ostrich grower and maintenance pellets from um, Missouri, um, we recommended to increase the alpha alpha roughage or to find other roughage sources to increase the structure of the diet and as we always do clean and fresh water at all times. So here you can see a result. So this is the same animal once in November 18 and once in January 2021 and you can see that the white feathers have gone down drastically and that he looks a lot better to date. Um, however, in 2020, 20, um, there was no switch to the Missouri Sioux food um, pellets due to a difficult year due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, yeah, it was difficult for all of us, but um, the owner increased um, the alpha alpha roughage in summer and also um, has additional grazing on pasture in winter as well as um, experimented with different local roughages for example cube local cacti plants so the plants but not the fruits um, which contain pectin water and tannins and can be beneficial mainly for um, fecal quality and the digestion well, I want to thank you for your attention and if you have any questions I would be happy to answer them and hear what the references that I used for this case. Brilliant, thank you so much Angela. You got us out of a bit of a tight spot then, so thanks for that. Um, our next talk is by Marcin Prebelo and he is a PhD student at the University of Agriculture in uh, Krakow. His talk is on the effect of adding silage leaves to the feed ration on the nutritional behaviour of black howler and angola colobus monkeys. And I, fingers crossed this, this video should work, so let's see. Hello everyone, my name is Marcin Przybu and I'm really happy to participate in this event again. This time I would like to present you the results of the study about adding leaf silage to the feed ration on the nutritional behavior of black howler and angelic. These species are truly folivorous primates, which natural diet is based mainly on young leaves. The gastrointestinal tracts of these monkeys are really well adapted to such a high fiber diet, where howlers are hindgut fermenters and colobuses are foregut fermenters. 
we all know that we have a lot of problems in captive nutrition of folivorous primates. However, based on the studies, we also know the beneficial role of high fiber diet in promoting gastrointestinal tract health, especially in this species. Therefore, current feeding recommendations for live eating monkeys underline the importance of high fiber intake. This may be done by three very important groups of components, and these are green leafy vegetables, high fiber pellets or biscuits, and browse. Browse is an essential part of the diet for these species. Fresh browse in the summertime and dry or less often frozen in wintertime. However, also silages are getting quite popular. We have started using this type of feed in 2013 in winter nutrition of Eastern black and white Colobus in Silesian Zoo. We ensiled the maple leaves without any additives or with addition of commercial bacterial inoculants or chopped carrots. We analyzed the chemical composition and fermentation parameters of the silage. However, the differences were so small that we decided to ensile three leaves without any additives from now on. The use of that silage resulted in increase of crude protein and fiber intake, but we do not know how does it affect the behavior of the Okay, it seems like we've lost sound. Hopefully we'll get it back. Let's just give it a minute to see. One of Kalebus is in Wrocław Zoo in Poland. The three leaves silage was made manually in 12 liter plastic buckets. We had four experimental periods, seven days each. First with standard diet used in nutrition in Wroclaw Zoo. Then the maple leaf silage was introduced into the diet. Then willow silage. And at the end, we came back to the standard diet again. Standard diet was based on green leafy vegetables, about 75% of the total diet. Leaf eater primate pellet, some other vegetables like carrots, dried browse, and brown rice. We did not decrease amounts of each feed, but we add the silage at the level of about 20% of daily ration. Animals were video recorded and videos were analyzed in five second intervals, and that result results I will present you today. However, we found our results interesting, so we want to watch the full-time videos now to make the results more accurate. Therefore, I'm going to show you some preliminary results. As a matter of fact, we hypothesize that these monkeys are generally very quiet and very calm, so we would not observe any significant changes in their behavior due to silage provision. And it was like that, especially in black holders. What was expected animals spent more time on eating basal ration, it means whole ration without pellet and dried browse, when silage was introduced into the diet. And on the other hand, monkeys spent less time on eating dried browse due to silage provision, but uh, it was a result of generally lower dried browse intake in these two periods. Similarly, in Calabas, we did not observe a lot of significant differences in eating behavior. Intake of dry matter of dried grouse decreased when silages were incorporated into the diets. But what was not expected, animals were more interested in dried grouse in the last period when we remove silages from a diet. The same trend, however, only numerical was observed in holders. Calabus spent more time resting in the periods with silage inclusion. What was also very interesting, animals on willow silage diet showed less aggressive behavior. Summarizing, browse silage was very willingly eaten, especially willow, and was more palatable than dried browse in this study. Silage improved dry matter intake and dry matter of feces. In other words, feces consistency in black howlers. And the latter one was really, really nice outcome of, of this study, as this is typical howlers problem. We did not observe a lot of changes in monkey's behavior into the diet, but actually this is a good sign and other proof that silage is really interesting option of browse provision for leaf eating primates. Thank you for your attention. Brilliant. That's the next talk. So and um, just to remind everyone, these talks will be available again if you missed any of that. And apologies for the pause there. I think it's to do with the um, system, the technology that um, might be buffering it slightly. 
Our next talk is from Samantha Sviak, a PhD student from the University of uh, Agriculture at Krakow, and her talk is the, on the effect of quality of low starch pellet in the diet and use of straw as a bedding on feed intake, eating and rumination behaviour in bonga antelope. Hello, my name is Samantha Sviak. I'm a PhD student from Krakow and I will present results of two studies about the effect of quantity of low starch pellet in a diet and use of straw as a bedding on feed intake and eating and ruminating behavior of bongo. Feeding of browsing ruminants in captivity is considered as especially difficult because of them denying of eating commonly offered roughage like hay. That's why concentrates, mostly cereal grains, are used. They are likely eaten by animals, but they are rich in starch which increases energy intake, but also leads to multiple health problems. Alternative to concentrated feeds are low starch pellets, which are more natural in composition, but their optimal dose for animals is unknown, the structure of pellets do not fulfill antelope's oral needs, and high intake of them may further decrease intake of roughage. Observations showed that when used as a bedding, straw is consumed by animals, but it's not recommended for browsers because of its poor nutritional value and high amount of silica. What is more, straw used as a bedding could decrease intake of roughage, especially when combined with high amount of pellet in a diet. Two hypotheses for two studies that were conducted within our project were proposed, assumed that high pellet dose and use of straw as a bedding have negative impact on intake of roughage and rumination behavior. Aim of the studies were to determine impact of dose of low starch pellet alone and combined with use of straw as a bedding material on feed intake, eating and rumination behavior of bongo. The first study was conducted on three adult female bongos in three-on-three -three Latin square design. Animals were put into one of three treatments with different amount of pellet, 0.75, 1.5 or 2.25 kg per day, and ad libitum access to meadow hay. The rest of the diet was the same, including lizard hay, browse and also other supplements fed together with pellet and referred as basal diet. Pellet contained 50% of crude protein and 20% of fiber and consisted mostly of dehydrated grass and lucerne. There was measurement of daily feed intake and video recording of eating and ruminating behavior. The second study was conducted almost exactly like the first study of study one. Okay, As you can okay? see, the higher pellet dose in a diet, the higher basal and total diet intake, but the lower hay intake. Dose of pellet also had impact on eating time and rate. Obviously, the higher pellet amount in the diet, the longer basal diet eating time, but there was also a tendency of decrease in daily eating time of the hay. Higher dose of pellet also increased eating rate, which, which means that the more pellet in a diet, the faster animals consume diet, what was the result of faster pellet dose eating. As for ruminating behavior, the higher amount of pellet in a diet, the shorter single rumination cycle duration. There was also a tendency of linear reduction of time spent by antelopes on ruminating per one gram of dry matter feed. The second study was more complex because of its two-factorial design. As you can see, bedding type and pellet dose alone had higher impact on feed intake than two factors combined. What is logical, the higher dose of pellet offered, the higher basal diet total intake. In general, using straw resulted in higher hay and browse intake, which was totally opposite to what was expected. What is important, bedding type had no impact on pellet intake. As for feeding behavior, pellet dose and interaction had impact on basal diet eating time, and interaction had tendency to impact hay eating time. In overall, the animals tend to equal total diet eating time, including straw consumption. As for feeding rate, although bongos in high pellet dose groups ate more, they ate faster than low pellet amount groups, especially when high pellet dose was combined with straw bedding. When it comes to rumination behavior, pellet amount had impact on rumination time, both expressed as minutes per day and minutes per one gram of dry matter intake. Similar to first study, the highest time was for low amount of pellet. Longer rumination time was observed when wood shavings was used as a bedding. Taking into account that we did not measure straw intake, uh, this difference was likely more apparent, which means that use of straw as a bedding decreases rumination time per one gram of dry matter intake. In conclusion, the higher amount of pellet in a diet, even low starch pellet, 
the lower intake of hay, eating time and rumination time can be expected. Such an effect was not observed when high pellet dose was combined with straw bedding and intake of roughage was even increased. However, high level of pellet in a diet when combined with straw as a bedding decreased rumination time and increased eating rate. Straw was clearly consumed by bongo. Animals spent about 45 minutes per day consuming it. This may happen in other zoos as well. Thus, bedding type may affect feed intake by animals, but if it's positive or negative, needs to be determined. Thank you very much. Great, really interesting. Okay, so thank you very much, Samantha. The next talk is by Lorraine Miller, and she is a great ape consultant. And the talk is on uh, transitioning to a fruit-free diet within all four great ape species, something we were discussing earlier. Hi, my name is Lorraine Miller. I'm a zoological consultant for Great Ape Consultancy. I was speaking to you today about transitioning great apes to a fruit-free diet. Tricor Zoo in the UK holds all four species of great ape, a non-breeding group of 17 chimps, a breeding group of six gorillas, a breeding group of six orangutans, and a breeding group of 13 bonobos. In recent years, there's been a great deal of research about the benefits of a fruit-free or reduced sugar diet for primates. There are nutritional benefits such as a reduction in sugar intake and an increase in the overall amount of food available when going fruit-free, which I'll talk more about later. Medical benefits such as an increase in dental health and a decrease in illnesses such as diabetes, obesity and great ape heart disease. And there's also many behavioural benefits too, such as a reduction in food-based aggression, often seen in larger groups or in more dominant individuals. In 2018, the Great Ape Diets at Twycross Zoo were reviewed and it was deemed necessary to make significant changes. So the main points were to remove the fruit, to reduce and replace the source of protein, to condense the pellet and to review the food that was used for training and enrichment. We also looked into the browse provision too. The first species to go fruit free were the chimpanzees. Their fruit was decreased gradually in 25% increments from 100% to 75% and then down to 50% of the original amount. Once at 50%, it was then removed completely. This was to minimize the dominant individuals from monopolizing a small amount of high value items. The pellet given was simplified. The primate pellet, which was lower in fiber and a lot higher in sugar and proteins was removed. And the leaf eater pellet, which was much higher in fiber was increased. The eggs were removed and replaced with nuts and seeds, although still containing protein, it was far less, and the nuts and seeds were able to be utilized for scatter feeds, which increased activity budgets as well. Also, due to the removal of the fruit, we were able to increase the amount of greens given to keep the overall energy content the same throughout the diet. The keeper observations showed that there was a better body condition score overall and a decrease in food-based aggression, particularly in the dominant animals. The increase in food quantity allowed the keepers to feed large amounts of food more regularly throughout the day. And it also enabled the keepers to vary their preparation and presentation, such as giving more whole food items. So the next species to transition to a fruit-free diet were the gorillas. Their fruit was removed completely from the very start. They received very little fruit to begin with anyway and were separated for cleaning. Keeping it completely had no behavioural effects on the group at all. The primate pellet was removed and the more fibre rich leaf eater pellet was increased. The removal of fruit enabled the increase in greens again to keep the energy level the same. And we also increased the browse provision as well. Keeper observations showed an increase in foraging time due to the increase in food quantity and the increase in natural behaviours such as browse stripping and using browse for nest building as well. The increase in quantity allowed the provision of whole food items a lot more, and also an increase in scatter feeds throughout the day. There was also a slight overall reduction in regurgitation and reingestion. The bonobos were the next species to go fruit free. Like the chimps, their fruit was decreased gradually until it reached 50% and then removed completely to avoid food based aggression from the dominant females. Again, the primate pellet was removed and the leaf eater pellet was increased. Eggs were replaced with nuts and seeds and keeper observations showed a decrease in food-based aggression due to an increase in the overall food quantity, which allowed larger feeds more frequently throughout the day. Whole foods were able to be utilized as well as further scatter feeds. However, a small amount of fruit was needed when new individuals joined the group to establish routines. 
The orangutans were the final species to go fruit free. Their fruit was removed completely as it was for the gorillas, as they were also separated for their first feed of the day. But we actually use nuts um, in the diet instead to replace the fruit during the routine time. Primate pellet was again replaced and increased by leaf eater, along with an increase in greens and also in brows. The results were more prominent in the orangs. Observations showed a much better body condition score, especially in one female that was particularly overweight. So the top photo on the right was her in the January before the diet change, and the bottom photo was taken that August of the same year, so less than six months after the diet change. The new diet increased the quantity of food, which in turn increased foraging time and also natural behaviours such as bark stripping and nest building, utilising the increased browse. The new diet allowed for whole foods to be fed due to the increased quantity and encouraged the orangs to feed from the meshery for longer periods, which also increased their foraging time and also general activity as well. Here is an example of one of the diet sheets. This one's for the bonobos. As you can see, the types of food are listed down the side and the amounts of food given to adults, juveniles and babies along the top and the totals are highlighted at the bottom. The left hand side table is the diet before going fruit free, which also includes the additional pellet and eggs. The right hand side table is after the diet change and shows the absence of all fruit items, primate pellet and eggs, a substantial increase in brassicas and greens and also root veg and shows the lymph feed supplement given, which was left unchanged. Browse was not recorded on the diet sheet itself, but was increased as often as possible, dependent on resources. Roughly, the bonobos received two large branches of browse per animal per day after the diet change. The food used for training and enrichment was also reviewed. Juice was used for training established behaviours, which was switched to sugar-free, and fruit was used for training new behaviours. Food based enrichment was also looked into with many sugary items such as frozen berries and honey being either removed or reduced and fruit tea was given throughout the day instead of juice as well which can also be turned into a nice sensory paste for enrichment which was a bonus. The results showed that the chimps and gorillas trained really well for the new rewards. The bonobos returned to a small amount of fruit to establish routines and in one individual for medication, but the hope was to remove that or phase that out at a later date. Orangutans had a high compliance rate for routines and training using nuts and juice instead of fruit. And that overall, the diet change was a success and proved very easy and a smooth transition to a healthier lifestyle. Yeah, thank you so people. much, Lorraine. That's really interesting and really concisely presented. So well done. Um, okay, so the next presentation we have is from uh, Pavel Gorka. Uh, who is from the University of uh, Agriculture in Krakow. So we have a lot of uh, those representatives today. Um, and their talk is on the behavioural effect of decreasing the amount of fruit offered in the diet of ring-tailed lemurs. My name is Pavel Gurka and I have opportunity to present results of our studies on the effect of decreasing Increasing amount of fruits offered in the diet on the behavior of ring-tailed lemur. In the nature, the diet of ring-tailed lemur consists mostly of leaves, fruits, particular one, tamarind that is available during rainy season, as well as herbs, seeds, and insects. Whereas in zoos, the diet for ring-tailed lemur consists of leafy vegetables, vegetables pelleted feet, which are recommended, and in many cases, large amounts of fruits and sweets, which are not recommended. Large amounts of fruits and other sweets in the diet for lemurs may lead to many problems, including obesity of animals and excessive aggression. Therefore, it is recommended to reduce the amount of fruits that are fed to lemurs in zoos. In our study, we try to determine the impact of substantial reduction of amount of fruits in the diet in exchange for vegetables and leafy vegetables on the behavior of ring-tailed lemur. The study was conducted on one group of animals, which consisted of one male and four females. Those were, were adult animals. And the study was divided into three stages. 
each stage consisted of 14 days and uh, three days before the end of each stage and three days after initiation of each stage, uh, we observed animals one hour after feeding. Uh, during this observation, we noticed feed intake preferences for feeds, such as fruits, vegetables, as well as water intake, uh, rest, fight, and vocalization of animal. During study, the animals were fed one kilo of feed, meaning 200 grams per animal per day. Uh, during stage one, the animals were fed standard diet that was used in Silesian Zoo. Uh, and the diet included vegetables, leafy vegetables and fruits. In this stage, however, the feeds were randomly selected and randomly offered to animals. This means that at least occasionally, the diet contained a lot of fruits. In stage two and in stage three, we standardized the diet. In stage two, the amount of fruits was set to 50% of the diet, and this amount was cut by half in stage three in exchange for vegetables and leafy vegetables. What we found was that uh, between stage two and stage three, intake of fruits was reduced by half which was logical because we reduced the amount of fruits that were offered to animals. Uh, whereas the intake of vegetables and especially leafy vegetables increased. Increased intake of leafy vegetables was observed uh, throughout um, the end of stage two and also in stage three. What we also observed was that grooming of animals was reduced whereas the animals spent more time resting, especially uh, in the end of stage three. In conclusion, in our study, lemurs gradually and without problems got used to changes in in the diet. After changing the diet composition, the activity of animals decreased, the animals spent more time resting. And after changing the diet, Lemurs were very eager to eat leafy vegetables. Thank you for your attention. Another great uh, talk there. And for our final talk today, uh, we have uh, Lion and Mark, a master's student from the University of Copenhagen. And they'll be talking on how feeding whole rabbits versus lean beef affects the behavior of captive jaguar. and I just finished my master's degree in animal science from University of Copenhagen back in September 2020. I did my master's thesis concerning behavioral effects of feeding lean meat and whole prey to captive jaguars and I did this in cooperation with Park and Sue in Sweden and this was also where the experiment was conducted. So why did I choose to do this study? The modern zoos today are very devoted to enhance the natural behavior of the captive animals and for carnivores, this is especially hard since it's either not allowed for legal or ethical reasons to feed with live prey. So there is this debate on whether we should feed with lean meat or whole prey. Since feeding with whole prey or carcasses can cause criticism from the public in some places around the world. There are studies that have shown that feeding with carcasses, bones and frozen fish have led to an increase in feeding and foraging behavior in different carnivores. And most of the studies has also seen uh, the feedings to reduce or cause a total deletion of stereotypic pacing behavior. So one could ask how these feeding methods could affect the behavior of captive jaguars. So the aim for this study was to document potential behavioral differences in feeding with lean meat and whole prey to captive jaguars with uh, expectations of increasing the consumption time and reducing stereotypic pacing behavior. The experiment was done with three jaguars from Park and Zoo in Eskils Tuna, one male and two females. Uh, and the feed types were chosen to be lean beef and whole rabbit, and each feed type was fed out for 10 feeding days. Two feed types were fed out as the same amount, 2.5 kilo for the male and 2 kilos for the females. 
and the feed was presented out on the floors for the jaguars in their indoor enclosures as you can see here and here. And for behavioral registrations, the jaguars were recorded from when they were presented for the feed and six hours for. In the study results, there was made a time budget for the two hours post feeding. On the y axis, there is the mean time of percentage the jaguars spent on the different behaviors uh, for the two hours. And on the x axis, as you see here, the different behaviors are st stated. The red column is for the lean meat period and the grey column is for the whole prey period. As you can see the time budget for the two hours post feeding are very similar for the two feed types with some exceptions in consumption time and lying down. As expected the jaguars used more time on consuming the rabbit uh, with an average of 15 minutes where they only used an average of 5 minutes on consuming the lean meat. The extra time used on consumption during the whole prey led to less time spent on lying down. As you will see in this video, during consumption of the lean meat, there is a general pattern of usage of the tongue and gently putting the meat out in pieces. Compared to when the jackals were fed whole rabbits, they were seen using the natural feeding technique of eating the prey from the head and down to the hindquarters, and they were chewing more and more, there were more usage of their jaws. For the pacing behavior, there was not seen any reduction as we would have expected. The jaguars spent on average almost the same amount of time on pacing for both feeding periods. However, there was seen a significant difference between the three individuals where female 2 did not pace at all, as you can see here. As expected, there was an increase in consumption time from 5 to 15 minutes. However, this increase was only 10 minutes from the lean meat to whole prey. Though the increase, 15 minutes on average for consumption is still a very short time considering the jaguars in the natural habitat can use up to two and a half days with their kill prey. As mentioned before, I did not see any reduction in the pacing behavior, the opposite of what was expected. This could either be because the stereotypic pacing behavior observed was not feed related or that the difference of the 10 minutes in the cons consumption time was not big enough to potentially affect the pacing behavior. Since there was a small increase in consumption time when feeding the same small amount of feed presented the same way, it would be interesting to increase consumption time even further. Jaguars in the natural habitat normally go for medium large prey of an average of 15 kilos, and here the feed was only 2 to 2.5 kilo. Given that the feeding of whole prey is one way of increasing consumption time, providing the jaguars with larger prey, then rabbits and feeding less frequently could be an option to increase consumption time. Or potentially to present the feed in a different way, making it harder for the jaguars to access the feed. I would expect these implementations to increase consumption time and have a larger effect on the behavior of the jaguars and could therefore be interesting to study further. Last but not least, I would like to thank you for your attention. Great, thanks Lean, and it's nice to see a photo of you there at the end as well. We missed some people's faces during the online of this conference. Okay, fantastic. So that's actually taken us up to um, the, the maximum time we have now. Um, so what we're going to do is get down everyone's questions um, and ask authors or sorry presenters to answer them and then we'll post those question answers up along with the videos that you can re-watch um, on the IASA uh, nutrition page and also probably linked on the Facebook um, page as well. Um, so apologies that we haven't had time for that. I just really want to thank everyone that's joined us for this morning and um, it's really been great to have such high numbers here again and I hope all of you can join us again tomorrow for um, the, the sort of next days, the second round of talks and maybe even the workshop tomorrow afternoon as well. Um, wherever you're uh, viewing from, wherever you are in the world, I wish you a great rest of your day and hope to see you all soon. Take care, bye bye.